All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2021 Arkansas Rice Production Meeting online. My name is Jared Hartke and I'm the Rice Extension Agronomist for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Thanks for joining us today as we take rice production meetings virtual in 2021. But we've got a great program lined up for you. It's really nice to see a lot of familiar names in the attendees list. Certainly, uh, I would rather be seeing all of you in person. And I know I speak for the other, other panelists and speakers here today uh, on that as well. Before we get started, I would like to mention that today's program counts as three CEUs for certified crop advisors and Arkansas agricultural consultants. Please remember that to receive full credit, you do have to stay and participate for the majority of the meeting. At the completion of the program, we will submit the CEUs for all attendees who submitted their license numbers. Please send an email to rice at uaex.edu if you have any questions on that. I'd like to welcome those of you that have attended our, our in-person production meetings in the past. Thanks for working with us in this format as well as the old one. And for those who are new to our production meetings, we hope this event is both informative and helpful. Wish we could have our, our meetings in different counties and get to see everyone face to face, but this online meeting is, is gonna be the next best thing. We've worked hard to make it valuable for you. We've got six presentations to share today, going over updates from our extension specialists. And after each presentation, we'll entertain a question or two if there are any, but once all the presentations are over, we'll have roughly a 30 minute question and answer session to, to go over all of the ones that we've received. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker who needs no introduction because I've already introduced myself. So here's our first presentation. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Jared Hardke, Rice Extension Agronomist for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Rice Production Meeting. I'd like to start off by jumping into a 2021 rice production update for the year. So we'll go ahead and dive right in with a very brief discussion of acreage from the previous year. We certainly saw a, a massive jump compared to 2019, roughly a 25% acreage increase in 2020 over the previous year. Certainly 2019, all of the rainfall that year combined with other problems saw a major drop from 2018 that repeated rainfall, a lot of prevented planting in 2019. We still had a, a decent amount, pretty large amount of prevented planting in 2020, but we were able to, to persevere, push forward and actually still get quite a bit of rice in the ground in 2020. Where it goes in 21, probably a modest decline at this point, that could be 1.3 million acres, maybe more, uh, maybe a little less. A little too early to say whether it's gonna fall all the way back to 2017, 2019 levels, but obviously soybean and corn prices have been increasing considerably of late. So a, a lot going on there, but with all the prevented planted acreage out there, there's still acres to be grabbed that if we're given the opportunity in the spring, there, there can still be quite a bit of rice planted, but the general expectation is certainly for a decline. Overall yield for the year, right in line with the previous three years, that, that really goes right with a lot of the comments that I heard throughout the harvest season. A lot of ups and downs from field to field in terms of performance, just kind of all over the board. But when the dust settled, most were, were largely right in line with their three to five year average on production so not a big shock there on the yield thought it would trend just a little bit lower than this but again uh, never looked like it was going to be too far off of what we've been doing for the previous few years what did we grow usually uh, an, an always interesting topic for most gemini 214 clearfield was the most widely planted in 2020 followed by xp 753 and then uh, the new full page hybrid 7521 those were in there and another couple other new hybrids will hop to 7301 and 7321 jumping in there quite a bit. Uh, diamond, conventional long grain in there at 10%. Medium grain, we definitely didn't plant near as much of as what we anticipated, kind of a little surprised at the drop there, but Jupiter and Titan, you know, combined about seven to 8% and, and that's a little bit down from where we typically are. So that was surprising. CLL 15, a new clear field variety with a pretty good jump there. And then PBL01 and O2, uh, roughly two and a half percent, some other clear field varieties in there as well. A few comments, uh, you can see real, real quickly, the 
kind of my personal list of recommended rice cultivars for 2021 is based again on, on me going through data and having a look and, and trying to make the best recommendation possible overall for what's out there. I usually get questions kind of framed the way that I've put this table together. That's kind of the basis for it by you know get a given group such as the conventional varieties. Which, which variety should I grow? So diamond still appears to be on top, but Pro Gold 1 looks very, very close to it in there behind or jewel and pro gold two that, that both seem to have a little bit better disease packages maybe than diamond and pro gold one but maybe not quite the top end yield potential but they may have a higher floor to be more stable across locations so we're going to see some of those on on some acreage really for the first time in 21 so we'll certainly get a better feel for that and then one of interest in looking at the data that will in a moment is dg 263l which is a new uh, conventional long grain variety, which which looks like it, it could very easily in the in the very immediate future jump possibly to the top of this list, but still some some limited testing from our standpoint so far, but uh, definitely belongs on the list. We'll see where it goes from here. Conventional hybrid 753 still at the top, 7501 and 7301 look very competitive, and there are some other new ones on the way as well. Clearfield variety, CLL 15, 16, and 17. There, there are some differences to be made there. Could probably argue 16 belongs on top, but really haven't seen it on, on any acreage outside of seed production fields and, and testing yet. So um, maybe I should slide it up there. Full page hybrids, 75, 21, 73, 21, very competitive with one another. 75, 21 gets a little nod for milling, uh, really what that boils down to in, in my opinion. As of right now, they're really only the, the PBL02 on the Provisia side for 21. So we'll be looking at that one again. Medium grain side, links, it's new, but it's it's consistently showing an advantage over Titan and Jupiter, but it does not have uh, full market approval. The same is true of CLM04, but it's it's competitive and certainly the only clear field medium grain to offer at the moment. So just touching on some of the data behind what's going on there, as I mentioned across the past few years, the Arkansas Rice Performance Trials, when we look at it and that CLL 16 does stand out about five bushels ahead of CLL 15. CLL 17, again, it's, it's at 195, it's behind, but if you just look at the 2020 where we've had it in testing, it's, it's close. So it's right in there. Uh, PVL 02, you know, a little bit behind those, but again, has the, the at advantage of the, the different herbicide package. On the medium grain side, a lot of competitiveness among the four, the, the one clear field medium grain and then the three conventionals that are out there now, but with links having the advantage, and in some cases a large advantage uh, in certain times. So that one's gonna be one to watch, but Jupiter probably still gonna continue to lead the way uh, for the next year, we'll see, but uh, and possibly tighten gain some more ground as well. On the conventional long grain side, the DG 263L, the one I mentioned before, uh, showing some outstanding yields in, in the limited testing that we've been able to do with it. But uh, we're, we're going to get, a, I think, a, a decent first year look at it on production acres in 21 and see where we go. But beyond that, uh, Diamond and Pro Gold 1, again, very similar in yield across a three year uh, lot of site average. And the same is true for Jewel and Pro Gold 2 lagging a little bit behind, but that disease package is better. So they look pretty stable uh, at due to that. So we'll see where we go. On the hybrid side, looking in right here, the two full page, a little bit behind 7301, 7501, and 753, but still very close. And so you kind of have the, you know, all of them grouped together by what your needs are uh, really performing very similarly. So there, there's some location differences, but on average, they're very, very similar and some trade-offs. I mentioned the milling of 7521 being a little better than 7321, but 7521 is a few days later and, and has a little more lodging potential. So again, making a decision based on your overall farm needs. Looking at the Arkansas commercial rice trials, the CRTs just in 2020, a lot going on here across a lot of locations. I'll kind of draw your, your attention uh, to, to the means column on the far right-hand side and any any number that's that's colored in, in green there always looks green on your on your screen like, like these here. Uh, either either it was the highest yielder at that location or it was within a few bushels of, of the highest yielder within a given group here, like the clear fields in Provisia. So you see CLL 16 
for instance, win a lot of sites and certainly carry the average uh, with CLL 15, not too far behind, but, you know, and definitely in the running on about half the site. So 16 looking like it's, it's leading more there. And 17 really mainly drug behind by, by a few sites where it did lodge. Uh, but I do think we can back off the nitrogen on that variety and, and help with that as we kind of learn and test it a little bit more. DG263L, again, carrying with the large average. Uh, Diamond, uh, again, still, still behind the, the 263, but uh, still leading the way for the rest of the conventional varieties at this point, but with Pro Gold 1 staying pretty close to it, but Diamond's still kind of the lead across the total number of sites. The two full page hybrids continue to swap back and forth across locations. You see the, the with and without the green highlight just back back and forth the whole way across. Uh, so, you know, if we probably tested one more site, they'd be equal, but uh, a little bit of lodging for 7521 at a site or two, really probably what drug it down from them being virtually the same. And then on the conventional hybrid side, you see again, what kind of what we were discussing about a lot of similarity between them, but the uh, new one, 7401, which will probably be more available next year in 22, uh, it was also in the mix on, on a pretty good number of sites along with 753 and 7501. And then 7301 is still right in there, very, very close with them. So a lot of competitive offerings there as well. Medium grain side, same story. Uh, Lynx and Titan kind of carried the, the, the overall yield across all the sites with CLM 04 and, and Jupiter not very far behind. Uh, but, it, but it wasn't as good of a year for Jupiter. It didn't appear like in 2020 and CLM04 being, as we've kind of seen it be, you know, competitive and, and yielding with the top yielders roughly half the time and, and typically not lagging very far behind, but, but staying pretty competitive. But Lynx and Titan, uh, Lynx a little bit later maturing like Jupiter and Titan being very early, that, that may be the shift going forward uh, from overall yield potential and production. Planning date to make just a few brief comments. Typically, like in 2018, you see the earliest planning dates, late March and early April, and all the way through mid-April in 19, that's typically our highest yielding planning dates. In 2020, that wasn't true. Excessively warm March, followed by a very cold month of April, uh, led to some lower yields with the earliest planning dates. And then the mid-April to early May actually were our highest in 2020, which actually bared out in the field with a lot of growers, but it threw a lot of people off on their usual expected performance. But again, we can definitely blame some environmental conditions for that, just as we can in 18 with this particular window here with that, that early May massive drop off and then a rebound, those things do happen. Same is true at Pine Tree, but it's been going on for a while that the, the really mid April through the early part of May is the optimum window to plant, typically the highest yields. Unfortunately, in 2020, we didn't even get to plant the earlier uh, planting dates due to excessive rainfall. Got it just dry enough to plant on the 21st and then it rained on the 22nd and away we went. Some seeding rate decisions, always a frequent topic of discussion for me, just as a general basis for varieties. We generally, you know, have a starting point on loamy soils of 30 seed per square foot. That's that SSF or 36 seed per square foot on a clay. And these rates are in pounds per acre. So, you know, always keep in mind, there can be quite a bit of variation from variety to variety in how many pounds you actually need to achieve those seeding rates. 69 for diamonds, 74 Jupiter, 79 for Lynx. Uh, those are some big differences. Now, some of those are long grain, some of them are medium grain, but keeping in mind to get similar seeding rates, you, you're going to have to watch and check that drill calibration. The same is still true on the hybrids except we're looking for around 10 seed per square foot on a loam or 12 on a clay, but you still see even within the hybrids with a little bit of difference in seed size, anywhere from 21 to 24 pounds per acre of seed to, to get to actually a similar number of seed being planted. So again, always important to, to check your actual seed count, seed per pound of whatever you're planting so we can kind of get that dialed in. Using diamond just as an example, uh, you see 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 seed per square foot uh, across a lot of trials. These are from 2017 and 18 uh, in this situation. But you see the you know, anything in blue has a, you know, a significant drop off uh, from the highest yielding uh, seeding rate. And so you see you know, a trend toward the higher seeding rates uh, to give you the highest yield. Not a shock. Most of the time, you know, even 20 seed per square foot 
looks pretty good, but to get toward the highest yields, it's it's 30 and above through most of these. That's for grain yield. Uh, but if you spin it to net return, suddenly we see that uh, again everything else is standardized except uh, you know having more uh, you know applying the the seed cost, making it deviate everything else the same, you see, again, the lower seeding rates actually bring a, a higher net return. Anything above here, the, the 10 seed per square foot, they're all pretty similar. The same again with a slight trend up, maybe a little trend up, um, a lot of variability at that site, but, but, you know, staying off of that lowest. So, you know, getting in that 30 seed per square foot range, we may not need to push much higher very often, again, just from the, the potential of a net return. However, you know, reducing the seeding rate much at all brings in that risk. You, you can't just magically put seed back if anything goes wrong, whether it's birds or planting into poor conditions. So return on investment is very important when considering seeding rates. You can see in that diamond was just an example. I can throw a lot of varieties up there to be further examples that continue to show a similar story. It, it may nudge in your opinion of their seeding rate slightly one way or another, but a lot of times it is diminishing returns, pushing those rates up really high. And again, keep in mind all those seeding rate studies have full package seed treatments on them. So that's a, an insecticide plus fungicide package to, to protect from seedling disease as well as rice water weevil grape colaspis. So we're protecting what we're already putting out there in the first place. Uh, but at any rate, 30 seed per square foot, an ideal target for most varieties. That's about 70 pounds an acre for some varieties, but maybe as much as 80. Hybrids, we want to be, uh, you know, they are different, but 10 seed per square foot is an ideal target. That's 22 pounds for some, might be as much as 24. We can cheat maybe a little lower if conditions are ideal, perfect, and a good forecast. Uh, everything's going in well, but the more your, your questions increase about the conditions you're planning into, the more we need to consider nudging the rate up to offset some issues. Again, seed to soil contact, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, watching out for how much more we're spending to, to put more and more seed out there versus the return. And that's not even getting into the topic of getting overly thick and, and what that's going to do for, for disease and lodging issues that are, that are bound to come into play once we push it too far. A few quick comments on harvest aids. And I'm, this, this one is just an example from 2018 on XP753. Uh, we started at a pretty high moisture range, 25 down to 23, 22, 20, and 15. And, and unfortunately, we got a little shift here in the, in the dates, but you got uh, harvested three days after application or seven, and most of these are a three and a seven, but you got a three and then a 10-day gap and a six-day and a 10-day gap, and then a three and a six-day. And most of what you'll see here uh, from a grain yield standpoint, your biggest issues come when, when you wait too long to harvest after application. It's usually there that you're seeing the biggest drops. Of course, this one happened to be already be six days before we could get into a cut due to rainfall. That's when you see those issues. From a head, or, uh, excuse me, grain yield in 2019, uh, we tried to focus on some lower moistures and really didn't, but got rid of the timing. So all these were harvested in three days and you really don't see much issue this one, you can see the, the moisture kind of got down there and hung up due to weather, 19, big surprise. Um, and actually the, the tree did harvest in three days, threshed a lot better because all the moisture we couldn't get rid of at that time. And so didn't see much issues. Head rice yield, same story. When we, when we waited, you know, really beyond uh, just a few handful of days, that, that's when head rice yield really started to, to fall off. Uh, you saw the biggest gaps there. Uh, but it wasn't always as dramatic. Of course, we got, uh, again, a large one there where it was allowed to sit out there for too long. 2019, looked at lower moistures, all of them harvested in three days, and you see them all stay very, very close, whether they're treated or not, even when we got down to very, very low moisture. So uh, just something to keep in mind, there's a lot more in play there, but our goal is to harvest in five days or less after application. Get beyond that, and there's the, the very real potential for some loss of grain yield some loss of head rice yield. Not everybody has that happen, but there's your greatest risk. Uh, based on this data and, and some other not shown, hybrids probably need to lean a little bit lower toward 23% moisture before we start considering making applications. Varieties, we can probably still stick with the older recommendations of starting around 25%. The bottom end of the range is less certain. We've traditionally said, you know, stop spraying 
uh, salt or sodium chlorate around 18%. The data looks like we can probably go lower than that. But keep in mind, once you start getting below 18% grain moisture, your head rice yields are going to naturally decline anyway, kind of no matter what you do. So adding harvest aid, you're just going to up that risk of over drying and just bringing them down in, in general. So let's not apply too early and try to get it out very rapidly after we make that application. Uh, a few quick keys to success, obviously getting P and K out 04560, 04590 covers a lot of acres uh, in, in our rice production area and don't skimp on the zinc. Plant whenever you can, but try to finish the fields. I harp on this every year and still get questioned. Uh, we can certainly plant just about faster than we can do anything, but planting is what we can keep up with in terms of getting levees up. And that's kind of what I mean by the field, you know, finished actually getting uh, drains in, levees up. I don't have to be butted and everything, but uh, at least kind of where we're we're done and we can get herbicides out and things ready. Planting the amount of seed we need to, to hit some minimum plant stands, say 10 plants per square foot for varieties or five for hybrids. What do you have to do to achieve that combination of field conditions and obviously seeding rate? Uh, herbicides, pre after pre after pre. Uh, I like to consider gradually increasing pre-flood nitrogen rates. That doesn't mean anything drastic. That's where most of our yield comes from is that pre-flood nitrogen, even when we're making other applications later. So, and when I'm saying gradually, five to 10 pounds urea a year, if you're not seeing any disease problems and any lodging problems, you can probably stand to push that, that urea rate just a little bit. And obviously at the first sign of anything, beginning to look negative at all, back it off five or 10 and, and say you're good and, and don't make it worse. Getting to flood, we have a pretty big window. There's the optimum window and then there's that final date to apply nitrogen. If you're looking at the DD50 program, you've got a few weeks there. You can go early if conditions are great, rice is growing well, but try to make that happen by the end of the window and, and get that rice flooded uh, so that we don't, don't leave yield on the table by waiting too long. Riceadvisor.uaex.edu, uh, great on computers and mobile devices, whatever you need. You can see all the different apps here uh, from accessing the 50 program, rice seed calculator, fertilizer calculators, all that stuff, rice and advice videos, all those things to kind of help you on your way. Again, great, uh, acts like an app. It's internet native, but acts like an app. Uh, here's all my contact information, cell phone number, Twitter, email, all that good stuff, useful websites, hopefully that you can uh, jump into uh, if you'd like to sign up for the Arkansas Rice Updates newsletter that's uh, sent out weekly during the growing season, send an email there. And if you want to receive text message reminders, either about which may include the, the updates newsletter as well as other things, text the word rice to the number 69922. Huge thanks to my crew who uh, uh, absolutely, none of this is possible without, uh, depend on them for, for everything. Can't, can't thank them enough. Also can't thank enough the Arkansas Rice Checkoff, which comes directly from Arkansas Rice Growers administered by the Arkansas Rice Research and Promotion Board. And that, that's gonna go for the majority of presentations you're gonna see here today as well. Uh, on behalf of myself and everyone else and the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture, Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you have a great year. All right, I'd like to remind everyone to, to use the question and answer box to submit any questions you have about the research that you're hearing about today. And after the presentations conclude, our presenters will be on hand to answer your questions. I do have at least one question to answer live here uh, for, for the one that, uh, and actually a second version of the same question just came in. Uh, what is the seeding rate for the new DG263L, uh, that, that new long grain variety from Nutrien? And my answer there is I believe it might be able to lean lower than, than our standard 30 seed per square foot. I will say that maybe because the, the limited data that we were able to get in 2020, uh, really the, the two seeding rate sites we had both had some problems It still did excellent yields at pretty low plant stands. Uh, so it was due to standing water, imagine that, uh, that lowered them. But for the time being, probably want to stick very close to that 30 seed per square foot. If you were to try to reduce it, I would only do so very slightly. And again, under, under very ideal conditions on that. So planting very early, 
uh, possibly questionable. I'm absolutely going to stay with our standard rate, but with a little further work and some more uh, usable sites, hopefully we can we can move right on through there uh, with that. Um, one more question I'll go ahead and jump to before moving on to the next presentation has to do with uh, milling yields, why they may have been so much better this year. And really my thoughts on that had to do with, with what was seemingly an overall mild fall, even though we were planted later. Uh, really, it, it was very mild conditions. We didn't have a lot of excessive heat or necessarily real, real excessive moisture and had some pretty good harvest windows throughout that time. So uh, that, that's really gonna be a huge driver with minimizing those wetting and drying cycles as that, as that grain naturally dries in the field. That's, that's a huge factor, the, the massive wetting and drying event. So uh, very short version of some of what was going on there with milling. So with that, uh, next up is Dr. Tommy Butts, Extension Weed Scientist at the Lonoak Extension Center, and he'll give an update on rice weed control. Hello, my name is Tommy Butts, Extension Weed Scientist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. And thank you for joining me today for the rice weed control portion of the 2021 Rice Production Virtual Meeting for Arkansas. Now, the first thing that I wanted to jump into and talk about was herbicide resistance and provide an update for across the state. Now, I'm going to hit on a little bit of results from a survey we conducted this fall to help highlight throughout the entire presentation some different things that we're discussing, but then also I'll get into some of the screening results from Dr. Norsworthy's screening program. So right off the bat from the survey results, one of the questions we asked was, do our, our rice producers, consultants, et cetera, suspect that they have herbicide resistant weeds, excluding barnyard grass, so other problematic weeds, do they suspect that they have herbicide uh, resistance in their rice fields? And with a resounding yes, we had 84% of the respondents say that they suspected other weeds being herbicide resistant in their rice fields. When we asked specifically about barnyard grass, if they had herbicide resistance, once again, a whole lot of yes votes came in and it was actually 86% of our respondents said they suspected herbicide resistant barnyard grass in their rice fields. So again, very problematic weeds there. When we talk about some of those other weeds that were mentioned as far as resistance, it included things like rice flat sedge, which is commonly found resistance across the state. We typically expect 90 to 95% of our populations are ALS resistant. There was also weedy rice mentioned, palmer amaranth, uh, smart weeds, uh, sprangle, all kinds of different options that were presented for those other weeds. Now, as far as barnyard grass, uh, these are the latest results from Dr. Norbert's screening program for the past three years, so 2017 through 2019. They're currently testing all the 2020 samples right now in the greenhouse. But uh, for the past three years, you can see how widespread resistance is across the state for propanil facet, uh, uh, new path preface, and as well, loyant. Uh, we have widespread resistance across the state confirmed for those four. Our ACC ACE inhibitors is a little bit better news. It's less widespread, so that's things like clincher, our provisia. Uh, we do have, you know, quite a bit of resistance still, but there's less of it out there than these other four. And maybe the best news, I'm going to take the optimist approach, is that there's, uh, uh, we haven't had as much command resistance as these other ones either. We've only confirmed it so far in these three counties. So that's great news in the aspect that hopefully it's not real widespread and we still have the use of command for the majority of the state. Now, it's not good that we have confirmed resistance, but at least if it's not widespread, hopefully we can slow this spread and protect command by using other residuals, overlapping them, you know, tank mixing them, all those kinds of things, and make sure that we save this for the majority of the state because that's a real important herbicide for us. So again, be aware of, all, of this widespread herbicide resistance. And you know, in a lot of these cases, I'm just illustrating that we had at least one population test positive. We also had several populations that were brought in that tested positive or, or confirmed resistant to five modes of action all in that one population. So that's real dangerous when we start having that many resistances stacked on top of each other for trying to successfully manage it in rice. The next thing I wanted to discuss was the full page system and full page hybrids. The number one thing I want to get across with this system is that the weed control is exactly the same as the clear field system. If you've been growing clear field and you've been in the clear field system, full page does not change your weed control part of this. It is the exact same. And so what I'm getting at with that is if your barnyard grass or your weedy rice is already resistant to new path, full page is not going to help because it's also resistant to preface. They're the exact same herbicides. 
And so the full page is not helping us on the weed control aspect if you've been in a clear field system and you have resistance already to a clear field system. What full page does help us with is these hybrids have a much greater tolerance to ALS inhibitors than their clear field hybrid counterparts did. And so, uh, especially the past couple of years where it's been a little cool and wet, we've seen a lot of ALS injury flash up, this yellowing chlorosis stunting happen out there in those fields. Full page hybrids can really help us out a lot by mitigating some of that risk because they just have a greater tolerance. You won't see this injury in that system as you would with some of those clear field hybrids. Uh, this also, you know, similar, the ALS injury has popped up a lot in the past couple of years because we've been tank mixing and giving some heavy loads of ALS chemistries like a regiment permit tank mix. And that overload of ALS chemi chemistries has caused some of this injury. Full page again with this greater tolerance, we should not see that uh, to the extent we've seen it with some of our clear field systems. Now in the full page system, we need to make sure to use preface and postscript herbicides. So they're the same as New Path and Beyond, but due to labeling things, Preface and postscript is used in full page, new path and beyond is used in the clear field system. Uh, the rates are the same though. So for preface, we wanna use six fluid ounces and with postscript, five fluid ounces. Next, I wanted to dive into a little bit on sedge control and particular, uh, this white margin flat sedge has really started to make itself known more across the state. Uh, and I've had several calls on it. To help us ID this specific flat sedge, I've got a few pictures here. Uh, it has some really dark, deep red roots that are very common. No nutlets, no rhizomes, but this deep red color is really indicative of white margin flat sedge. It also uh, develops this white underside to the leaf surface, but keeps a green mid vein. So that's very characteristic. And then the seed head tends to me what I like to describe as it's a combination of yellow nut sedge and rice flat sedge. It's like if you combine those together, that's the seed head you get. Some other characteristics include no pine needle smell. So this is very common to rice flat sedge and gets mistaken for flat sedge a lot, rice flat sedge a lot. But if you would pick it up and crush it, it doesn't have that smell like rice flat sedge does. That doesn't have that strong pine needle smell. Also, this weed is a slightly late emerger, normally from mid to late May. And then the base of this plant gets really fleshy and waterlogged, especially later in the season. So different, several different uh, identification characteristics available there to try and help you ID this one from the other problematic weeds. Now through some uh, on-farm studies and greenhouse uh, studies, we found some best herbicide control methods for this flat sedge. And this really almost applies to rice flat sedge as well. But the best pre-emergence residual products were Bolero and Sharpen by far, uh, gave us the best residual control of this. From a post-emergent standpoint, Bassagran is our number one. It's given us 100% control in the greenhouse every time when we sprayed six inch plants. So I highly recommend that. Loyant is also very good though, giving us uh, greater than 90% control. And if we have small sedge plants out there, we can get away with a lower rate of that eight fluid ounces per acre of Loyant. Finally, I wanted to mention rice bow may also be a good option if you have some real bad sedge fields like this between uh, white margin or rice flat sedge. The propanil part of rice bow has activity on that flat sedge and will give us um, some pretty good burn down power on those sedges, especially if they're small uh, and it'll at least set them back. But then we also get the bolero or thiobin card part of rice bow that gives us the best residual out there and will hopefully stop any more flushes. So we get a little bit of both worlds here with rice bow by having residual, but also some post activity. So it may be a good option out there for some growers as well in some really bad sedge uh, situations. Now I've also had calls on some uh, a lot of other oddball sedges, as you can see here. Uh, unfortunately, there's always minimal to no data available on herbicide options for these. So really our best option is probably to do tank mixes or sequentials to make sure we get successful control if you have one of these in your field by chance. Uh, so mixing, you know, mixing or a sequential of an ALS inhibitor like Permit or Gambit, and then using Loin or Bassagran as well. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, but when we don't know how they're going to react, you know, it could be more like yellow nut sedge or it could be more like rice flat sedge. It's going to have to kind of take a combination approach to really manage those oddball ones successfully. Now, we do have some more uh, resources out there for sedge ID as well as control. You can follow these links or scan these QR codes and, and access those different publications that we have available. So feel free to do that as well. The next thing I wanted to talk about was an, uh, an aerial spray volume study that we conducted this last summer, uh, just south of Jonesboro at the Northeast Rice Research and Extension Center. 
I've had several calls and questions on how these lower spray volumes really act on our weed control out there coming out of egg aircraft. So we wanted to test this straight using an actual egg aircraft. So every, you know, the whole setup was what would be commercially acceptable out there for these applications. Now, the first thing that I'll talk about is coverage here from these water sensitive cards. And that acted like we would expect as we went from three to five to seven GPA, we increased our coverage. Okay, it makes sense, more volume, more coverage. Here's a unique result though, was our droplet size. As we went from three to five to seven, we also increased our droplet size as we went across. Now that is due to the inherent changes we have to make on a plane to get more volume out. So what we did in this study, we had to increase our spray pressure and we had to increase our orifice size. By doing those two things, both of those things increased droplet size out of an airplane. And so we actually increased our droplet size by just strictly increasing our spray volume. They're kind of linked. That's what's a little bit different than a ground rig. These two things, droplet size and spray volume, are even more linked on a plane than they are on a ground rig. So I want to make note of that, especially when we talk about our next slide for weed control results. The other interesting thing real quick here is that uh, the number of droplets on each card was statistically the same whether we had three gallons per acre or seven gallons per acre. So what I mean by that is even with a lower spray volume, we had the same number of droplets hitting this card as we did this card because the droplet size was smaller. So even though we had less coverage, we had the same number of droplets actually hitting the target. Now, when we look at weed control, barnyard grass acted like we'd expect. As we moved up in volume, we increased our, our weed control, right? Seven did better than three. But what was unique is when we looked at rice flat sedge control, it stayed the same across treatments. Three did just as well as seven. And I tie this back to that droplet size effect and how those weeds are structured. So rice flat sedge is a very vertical, narrow leaf type plant. It needs smaller droplets to get good coverage on it and stick to that plant. Larger droplets are just going to bounce, shatter, or miss the target completely. And so even though we had increased spray volume, that increase in droplet size you know, ruined any chance of that increase in volume actually helping our control of flat sedge. In contrast with barnyard grass, it had a wider leaf surface, a little bit taller, a little bit flatter in parts. The droplet size increase that we observed in this study didn't impact the retention of droplets on this surface. And so then increasing our volume gave us more droplets that could be retained and gave us better control on barnyard grass. So I say all of that to basically come to the conclusion that it's not as cut and dry from an egg aircraft on increasing volume is going to increase our control. It's just not that cut and dry. There's a lot of other factors that get changed by just strictly trying to increase our volume on a plane and thereby subsequently impacting our weed control. So again, seven gallon per acre didn't hurt our rice flat edge control. It still gave us the same, but it's much more inefficient than what three gallons per acre was. So if we can start to kind of match our applications with what weed species we have out there and what herbicides we're using, and we're going to be continuing to conduct research on this, I, that's really where we need to go in the future. And I really just wanted to highlight that by constantly preaching a higher spray volume from a plane, it doesn't necessarily always hold true that that's going to give us better weed control. Okay. Next, I wanted to get into some barnyard grass management practices uh, to hopefully help manage that in our rice acres out there. One of the questions we asked on our survey was what percent of time do our, our respondents fail to effectively control barnyard grass with their first post? And we had a range of responses but our overall average was that 44% of the time or almost half of the time, we fail to control barnyard grass with our first post herbicide application. That's very scary, especially when we look at the next question that we had asked on the survey was if that initial herbicide application fails, how many additional applications are required to control it? And most respondents said it takes three more applications to successfully control barnyard grass if it escapes that first one. That's really, really scary that it takes us that many more applications to, to, to success, successfully manage it if we miss it with the first one, especially when we put costs to it. Uh, from our survey, the average cost uh, to manage barnyard grass, this is just strictly managing barnyard grass, was $87.45 an acre. That was 81% of the total herbicide cost. So this is just strictly herbicides focused on managing barnyard grass that ate up 81% of our typical total herbicide cost reported from our uh, respondents to the survey. So I say all of that to basically come to the conclusion that barnyard grass is a big deal. It is the Ron Burgundy of weeds and it is driving our producers mad. Now the best thing that I can tell you for barnyard grass control tips 
is residuals, residuals, residuals. Get those residuals out of pre-emergence and make sure that we're overlapping 14 to 21 days and make sure that we're getting activation and plenty of water because that's going to be key to getting successful control of, of barnyard grass season long. It's, it's, it's what it's going to take is getting residuals and overlapping them and using those to our advantage. Now, uh, I have some pictures down here from the, um, some small plot research at the Roar Research Station. Like I said, with overlapping, you can see here where we had a command followed by prowl and bolero plot. And this is going to flood with no post-emergence options. It was just strictly command followed by prowl and bolero. And you can see the excellent control that we've got out of that sequential overlapping of residuals. I also wanted to mention that FACET consistently shows uh, us in small plot research that it's better when we put it as a pre-emergence product, especially if we're mixing it with command up front, than if we try and rely on it early post or rely on it as a post-emergence product. It gives us better control pre and gives us more flexibility uh, basically by time because we've got better control up front. It gives us more flexibility for that second application to come in after it. So I highly recommend moving FACET into our pre-programs and you can see that picture here with nothing else, only command and FACET sprayed on this plot. That's honestly pretty good control. The final thing I wanted to hit on was a tank mix of command, bolero, and league. Now this is a very expensive mix, I understand that, uh, but across two sites and two years now, so four site years of this, this has been my best tank mix for weed control out there, including barnyard grass, and you can see a picture of it down here in the lower right. So it, I'm not recommending it full scale across all of your acres, but if you've got a field that's problematic or you've got maybe a smaller field you wanna try this on, I definitely recommend trying it because although it was you know, really expensive up front, it saved me at least one or two post applications on the back end and ended up being a cheaper overall herbicide program just because I got such great residual control out of it for that length of time. So again, might be something worthwhile to check into on your farm. Now I say all this for residuals because like I mentioned with the survey results and from discussions with producers and consultants in the past couple of years, it seems that if, if we were ahead of the game, we got residuals out, we had you know good control all season long. If we got behind it all, if we missed that first application of barnyard grass and it took three more to try and control it, we normally ended up with fields like this that were just a mess and got overtaken because we couldn't play catch up. So using those residuals effectively to our advantage is really critical. The next thing when we start using our post herbicides, um, just be aware of this, that we have seen a temperature effect on some of our post herbicides. This was a study we conducted this year as well. And basically I wanted to highlight that when we had a lower temp, somewhere around 80 degrees for a daytime high versus a, a higher temperature, somewhere around 90 degrees for a daytime high, we saw that we lost control with things like loyant clincher and regiment pretty significantly just because of that higher temperature. Whereas things like grasp or beyond, we didn't lose control at all with that higher temperature. We maintained control or even gained a little bit of control. So basically what I'm saying with this is when we start getting later in the season, we have those higher temperatures, we may need to be a little bit more selective on which herbicides we're using, or maybe on the time of day when we're trying to make these applications and try and, and, and you know, put them out into our best situations possible because even just a temperature effect, we've noticed has, has impacted some of our weed control and it may be a cause of why we're getting some of those misses with those post products. So just be aware of that, keep that in the back of your mind when you're moving forward through 2021. Now I did wanna get into some row rice weed management tips as well. This is a little bit different system than flooded rice. So the first thing I wanted to mention with managing uh, weeds and row rice is make sure that we have careful water management. So you can see in the picture here, we've ran water down the furrows, but not enough to completely wick across our bed here. We got to make sure that we have enough water to fully saturate our entire bed. That's really critical for activating all of those pre-emergence residual herbicides, as well as making sure that the tops of our beds and those rice plants aren't uh, stressed or any weeds that are on top of that rice bed aren't stressed and not taking up as much herbicide as they should if we make an application. So water management is critical. Also, I just wanted to say watch out for oddball weeds. So we've got a few down here, sickle pod, carpet weed, ground cherry. There's a lot of those that now pop up because we don't have the flood to take them out. Um, and so we have to deal with these as well. So far, things like propanil, grandstand, loint, and gambit have been our best options for successfully managing these weeds. Getting the ALS chemistries and getting uh, the oxen specifically typically really help us manage a lot of these problematic weeds that uh, we normally don't see in a flooded rice system. 
Some other tips, uh, again, residuals are key and the timing of those apps are crucial. So some of Dr. Barber's research has shown that 14 day interval for overlapping residuals is absolutely critical in row rice. If we wait to 21 days, it's too late at that point in row rice. So 14 days becomes very critical for our overlapping residuals. Sharpens necessary for Palmer control and for managing other Palmer plants post-emergence. We want to have sequential applications of Loyant at eight fluid ounces. Don't do sequentials of 16. Uh, you could end up with some injury on hybrids, but sequentials of eight fluid ounces can be very beneficial. And then using grand standard propanil followed by Loyant is also a good option. And if you want more info on row rice weed management, you can scan these QR codes or go to these links. We have a couple different videos out there of row rice management uh, recommendations. So finally, I wanted to hit on kind of my last topic was a takeaway for recommendations for 2021 weed control. If you can remember sports, you can remember our tips for weed control. And so what I mean by that is we want to start clean. We want to use pre-emergence herbicides, overlap residuals, required our IWM tactics. So things like, you know, pinpoint flood management, seed prevention, tillage, those kinds of things. Okay. We need to use all of those aspects too. They're required timely. And then we want to select multiple effective mode of action post herbicides that are, uh, you know, designed to match our emerged weeds. So if we can remember sports and we can remember these things, that's what's going to give us our season long weed control for 2021 in rice. Okay, so remember sports and remember these things and that'll help you out along a, a lot along the way. Now to tie in my sports mnemonic device there, I've got this video, I always got to work in my Arkansas football reference. And this is to demonstrate the power of integrated weed management and why those are a required part of our strategies. If we get all of these things working together, mechanical, chemical, cultural prevention, it's like our D linemen and linebackers smashing that line and shutting down the running back or weeds right at the uh, at that uh, um, first right at the line of scrimmage. Excuse me. Okay, if we can shut down those weeds right there and not let them get that first down, we're going to be have a really successful 2021 season. I'll finally just some other things coming coming down the road. I'm not going to hit on these very closely, but we have row coming down um, a quizalifop resistant cultivar and hybrid from Rice Tech. Uh, we're doing research with fertilizer impregnated with Loyant and then also FMC's new mode of action, but that's still a little ways down the road as well. So here's a few other things coming down the road and uh, I'm not going to hit on them any more than that. I'm kind of running out of time, but if you have any questions about these, feel free to ask. From there, uh, as always, we have a lot of other information available. Please, you know, pick up your, your MP44 at local county office and visit our website if you have any questions. We constantly are updating that with new information have plenty of thank, thank yous to say, but I really just want to thank, uh, pre, I really want to thank the Arkansas Rice Research and Promotion Board and the checkoff dollars that go to support a lot of our research and extension activities. Without it, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So it's greatly appreciated. With that, I thank you for watching. And uh, if you have any questions for me, uh, please get a hold of me at any of the contact info that's showing up on your screen or visit our website or stay tuned for the live question and answer period here and feel free to answer, uh, ask me any questions that you might have. So thanks for watching and good luck out there for 2021. All right, thank you, Dr. Butts. Uh, we do have a question or two that I would like to throw your way live really quick. Uh, the first question is, do you think we go to flood too quickly behind a pre-flood post application? Any herbicide uh, such as turning the well on as soon as the plane leaves the field or, or give it a day? Uh, well, thanks, Jared, and thanks everybody for joining the uh, the meeting today. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a good answer because I think it kind of depends a lot on our one the field setup. You know, if we have a lot of levees in the field, if it's a straight levee, if it's a zero grade, I think that changes. You know, how fast going to flood can affect it. Um, also the different herbicides, I think will affect it, you know, certain ones require that moisture faster than other ones. So I think that's also a challenge with, uh, with answering that question. What I would say generally is, uh, you know, if we, if we can't get water across it, you know, within a day, we typically probably want to turn that water on as soon as we possibly can to get moisture across the field and make sure a lot of those herbicides that those weeds are actively growing to make those herbicides work their best. If weeds aren't actively growing and it's dry conditions out there, those herbicides are not going to be as effective. Now, if we're in a zero grade field and we can get water across it pretty fast, 
it may be worth waiting, you know, at least a few hours kind of let herbicide get onto the weeds, start absorbing that kind of thing before we may get water on top of them and wash some of that off. Um, so there's a lot of give and take there, but that those would be kind of my general recommendations, I guess, as far as putting that flood on. Okay, we've had quite a few come in, but I'm going to throw you one more for right now and we'll, we'll hold some of the rest to the end. Uh, so if you have resistance to facet and new path, if you use them as a pre, will they give you activity that way? That's another good question. So whenever we do a lot of our resistance testing screenings, it's all post activity is what we're screening. Now, if you have resistance post, we generally say you also have resistance pre, but that doesn't mean that there's zeros. Uh, so if we apply something like, so say you have facet or new path resistance and you apply it pre, you're probably still going to get some control out of it, but we're talking, you know, maybe 50% or so. So you'll get something out of it, but it's still not recommended when we could try and hopefully move to other options like the command, the prowl, the bolero, those types of things. So Again, if you have that resistance post, you probably have it pre and you might get some control, but it's just not your best option at that point. All right. Thank you, Dr. Butts. Uh, again, th those of you that have continued to submit questions, we're, we're going to come back to those, uh, but, but to keep things moving along and, and cover all of our topics today, we're going to change gears a little bit to Dr. Nick Bateman, our extension entomologist, and he's next with some recommendations for insect control in rice. Hey everybody, this is Nick Bateman, the entomologist over here at Stuttgart. Uh, today I'm going to talk about some of our updates on our insect pest management in uh, rice, both in furrow irrigated and flooded. You know, in, in a lot of our areas, so back 60% of our rice growing region up and down that White River and all of our thin soils, part of Ashley County, we deal with grape colitis. Uh, you can see some of that damage in the background. We actually call that the bean row effect. And what that is, that's where late in the season in the soybean crop, uh, the, the grape claspus adults move in, they mate, uh, that female lays a, a couple clutches of eggs down there at the base of the plant, and those larvae hatch out and move down to the into the soil profile. Uh, so they, these larvae don't move uh, laterally, they only move up and down. And so they sit there all winter and they wait, and once we plant a rice crop, they move back up that spring and they start feeding on those, on that root system eventually leading to death there. And you can see where where that rice is thinned out, where it's thinned out is actually where the old bean rows were, where the rice is still standing, that, that's actually the water furrows. So that's what I was getting at about, they don't move left and right, just up and down. Uh, and you can see a picture down there, you know that, that larvae doesn't look like it could cause that much damage, but it, it can cause substantial stand loss, uh, leading, you know, death to the plants, thin stands. Uh, but it doesn't always end up looking like that bean row effect. You know, here we see these thinned out spots and, and typically, you know, I know we got a lot of precision graded and uh, fields out there that are that are fairly level, but there's typically usually a ridge left out there somewhere, even if it's just a slight incline there. And, and that's what you're seeing here. Those, those larvae or those adults, they target those higher areas. And you can see that that thinning happen out here in, in this stand and what's that, what that's going to lead to in most cases is higher populations of rice water weevils. So rice water weevils, this, this is the number one pest of rice in the Mid-South, number one insect pest. And you can see that that adult up there in the top left-hand corner, it's gonna cause those scarring or that scarring you see there on the leaves, that's all superficial. We don't see any yield loss uh, from that scarring. But if you notice down there in that bottom picture where you had that really thin stand and that, that really bad uh, eat up, root mass there, that's where the yield loss is going to come in. So those adults, whenever they lay eggs, once again, the larvae is going to move down to that root system and it's going to feed within those roots and, and that's what's going to cause our yield loss there. Uh, and you know, for both of these pests, we really don't have many control options other than seed treatments. We can go after uh, rice water weevil adults with a foliar and we can get some decent control there, but for the most part, our uh, best option is is with insecticide seed treatments and when it comes to grape colaspids it's, it's our only option. So you know the, the four seed treatment options from an insecticide standpoint we have in rice is Cruiser, Nipset, Dermacorn, Pertensa. So Cruiser and Nipset they're both neonics they work great on grape colaspids and they can be good on rice water weevil. One of the issues we see with uh, both of those products though 
is they're only going to last 28 to 35 days. So when we're planting early April, uh, late March into early April, you know, a lot of times we're not getting a flood till 45, 55 days after planting. At that point, both of those products are pretty much run out of gas. Whereas if you look at products like Dermacor or Tenta, both of those are diamides. Uh, they last for a really long time. They have a lot of residual there. Uh, they're great on rice water wheat. Um, but as far as great colaspis goes, we don't see any control there with Dermacor. It's very, very poor uh, for Tenza. You know, it looks better than Dermacor. It doesn't look quite as good as Cruiser and Nips, and it does provide some control. Both of those products, though, when it comes to army worms and stem borers, look look pretty good, and, and it looks like they're going to be a good option for bill bugs. We'll get into that uh, here in a little bit. So this is a combination of some of the data of, uh, or all of the data that Gus and I have produced over the past, what well, you can see there from 2008 to 2020, and we combined all of it just to look at cruiser nips at Dermacore uh, compared to our untreated. And if you look at just weevil control there, you can see a, a huge reduction there compared to the untreated for cruiser nips and Dermacore, with Dermacore having a slight edge. And we see the same thing when it comes to yield. Uh, all of them look better than the untreated. Dermacore has a slight edge. Most of that's due to it, it having better control of rice water weevils. Uh, same story with net returns. You know, we get good net returns over untreated for all of them. Uh, Dermacore, once again, has a slight edge. You know, we're seeing the same trend with pretend to they're very similar, similar products. Uh, just at the time when we had analyzed this, we didn't have enough pretend data add into it. So what do we do when we have areas, you know, like I mentioned up and down that, that White River region there, uh, what do we do on these thin soils where we're gonna have both great claspis and rice water weevil? And to put this in perspective on that picture there with those rice water weevils, our threshold is three to four per core. A core is a four inch core uh, and it's three to four larvae per that core. So we're running we're running about 5x threshold right here, and that's pretty common to see. Uh, so, so what do we do? We know our neonics run out of gas pretty quick. We know our, uh, our diamides aren't great on great colaspis. So what we've looked at over the past four or five years is combinations of, of a neonics or a cruiser or nips it in combination with either Dermacore or Pertenza. And if you look at the percent control here for rice water weevils, so this is looking at cruiser or nips it, uh, in conjunction with Dermacore, you know, Cruiser nips it by itself. We're looking at somewhere between 30 and 40% control of uh, rice water weevils. We add the Dermacore into it. We're up in that to almost 60%. Real similar story here with Fertenza. You know, you look at Cruiser nips it by itself. You're somewhere between 40 and 55, 60% control there. You add the Fertenza component in there and you're increasing that up to 85% to for that, that higher rate of Cruiser plus Fertenza. And to put that in perspective, so this was a trial conducted in 2017 where uh, Gus had massive uh, great colaspis pressure there. Some of the untreated were thinned out by 50 or 60 percent. Uh, and then we were running somewhere between 50 and 60 grass water weevils per core. So that's, you know, remember our threshold is three to four. So we're running extremely high numbers of uh, rice water weevils. This was at Pine Tree, uh, which is known for both of these pests. And you can see there that cruiser Dermacore has a 38 bushel increase over the untreated. Now this isn't the case everywhere. We don't always see a 40 bushel increase with these products, but it's very common to see somewhere between the 10 and 15 bushel increase with one of these combinations over just going with a cruiser or nips alone. Um, so moving on to, to rice stink bugs. You know, we've done a lot of work over the past five or six years. Gus had a graduate student uh, working on thresholds for a while. I've continued most of that work. Uh, and guys, we, we don't have any reason to change our thresholds right now. We're gonna keep our thresholds at, at uh, five rice stink bugs. So that's including adults and nymphs uh, for the first two weeks and then 10 for 10 the second two weeks. And so that first two weeks is gonna protect us against yield. So we're talking about the flower and milk time period there. That second two weeks is going to protect us against quality loss or peck. Uh, so that's soft dough and, and hard dough. And one of the big things we, we want to reiterate here, and I know we've showed this slide a lot, but, but termination. 
So we can terminate sprays for rye stink bugs once we get to about 60% hard dough. And what we're calling the hard dough is straw colored kernel. So once once the majority of our panicles out there, most of the fields at 60% hard dough, as long as we don't have any bad weather fronts moving in, a lot of rain, a lot of humidity that's gonna soften those kernels, we can stop spraying for rye stink bugs without any penalty from a yield loss or pe peppy rye standpoint. Uh, one thing that has popped up the past couple of years though with, with rye stink bugs is potential problems with, with Lambda. So you know Lambda has been the go-to product for rye stink bugs for 20 years. And you know the only other real competition out there that's not a pyrethroid is a uh, Tenchu. And you know the big thing between Warrior or Lambda and Tenchu is the price difference there. You take a one pound generic Lambda and you can put it out for roughly a dollar fifty, maybe two dollars on the high end per acre, whereas Tenchu is going to be about twelve bucks an acre. And in most cases, for instance, here 2019, this is Lincoln County. These are 25 acre blocks sprayed with an airplane. You can see we're running, so this would have been flour and milk whenever we sprayed this the first time. We're running 5X threshold there uh, at, at our pre-spray. In our three day and six day, we're still over threshold. So we retreated the field after that. It cleaned them up. We didn't have to treat again. But if you look, both of them products, we can't separate them. They look the same. So you move into 2020 and you know once again we're we're in that flour and milk stage we're running 2x threshold um uh, once again 25 acre block sprayed with the airplane uh at three days we're below threshold at six days we're below threshold at this point we've moved into soft dough so our thresholds changed to 10. so all the way out we were still below threshold we got away with one application but we do start seeing a little bit quicker rebound there we're starting to see uh see more stink bugs behind that lambda application and it seems like tenchu may be starting to have a little bit of an edge there now we have we have had some reports of some failures and we've run quite a few bioassays over the past couple of years and this this is our location last year in 2019 so this was up at wiener in poinsett county and and just uh just so you know what we did we we took petri dishes and we sprayed them with lambda we sprayed it with Warrior 2, and so our 1x rate, if you look across the bottom down there, that 1x rate's the 1 to 70 rate, so that 1.8 ounces per acre, and then we did a 2x, a 4x, a half, and a quarter x. And what you see here is, you know, it took a 4x rate to get 100% control of those stink bugs. 1x, we're only getting about 30% uh, at this location last year, and it had been sprayed with Lambda when you include this application three times. 2020 Chico County, we see a similar story here. The, the really concerning part though, is that even at a 4X application, uh, we're only getting about 60% control. And we see a similar uh, similar situation here in Crittenden County. Now, one thing I wanna point out about all three of these locations is this was late in the season. This was September going into October for all these cases. So we're not seeing a whole lot of middle of the season, but one thing to keep in mind, if you pick up nymphs, uh, behind the app, Lambda application, you may consider swapping to, to a product like Tenchu. Uh, fall army worms and true army worms defoliation in general in rice, you know, we saw quite a bit of it early in the season this year. Uh, the biggest question is, you know, is what, what am I looking at here? Is this damage? Is this economical damage? Am I going to lose yield based on this right here? And we've done a lot of simulated defoliation work over the past couple of years. Um, looking at this so we we would uh defoliate rice at, at multiple percentages at multiple timings and and honestly rice can take a lot of damage before you start talking about yield loss and so we we've got some new thresholds for this year uh for for defoliation in rice and, and we're not going to have any treatments go out for for seedling to two to three tiller the one caveat to that is if, uh, you know, we're on heavy ground that's cracked and those army worms can get down to the growing point, we probably want to spray them, but we see no yield loss at those timings, that seedling stage uh, all the way up to very early tiller. But for May and June plantings, um, we're going to spray if we exceed 40% defoliation at uh, five to six tillers uh, and 20% at green ring. So we do see quite a bit of yield loss there at green ring for those kind of planting dates. And it does get worse as you move into June. Uh, and if we're starting to see head clipping, we're also gonna make a treatment there. But 
biggest thing here is let's not get too excited about a whole or about defoliation. It takes a lot of caterpillars and a lot of time to, to get significant enough defoliation to cause yield loss. So with the increase in row rice acres, we've also seen a big increase with uh, rice billbug. And you can see a, a little collage here. You got everything from the larvae to the adult. And that, that adult's pretty big. You know, it's about an inch, inch and a quarter long. You can see some of those damaged uh, tillers up there in the top left-hand corner. But just for comparison, you know, we all know what rice water weevil adults look like in their size. And you see that rice billbug laying over there beside it. So, you know, it's a big weevil. It's much larger than a rice water weevil. Uh, and, you know, you can see it here feeding. That's an adult feeding. You can see it's inverted on that stem uh, with its mouth parts inserted into that stem. And what that's going to lead to is these dead leaves. So this is the first sign we see of, of a rice billbug infestation. You know, we get up somewhere around three to four, four to five tillers, somewhere in there we start seeing a few of these uh, uh, dead leaves poking up. And if you start chasing that back and start looking at the base of that tiller, you'll see where that adult inserted its mouth parts in there. You can see them circled up there um, where it inserted its mouth parts and it started feeding on that plant leading to that tiller death. And so if you look across this field, you know, at first it kind of looks like maybe some herbicide burn, maybe some fertilizer burn. Everywhere you see those white flags sticking up out there, those white leaves, those are dead tillers caused by rice billbug damage. So it can be pretty significant. You know, this was a field that was probably close to a mile long across the top of it, and this went for, or, you know, 40, 50 foot into the field. So that's a pretty significant amount of that field. Uh, and it was, it looked like this all the way across it. And then egg lay. So we're starting to see, uh, we're starting to pick up eggs out in the field around that fourth to fifth tiller. You can see it is pretty small there, uh, cream colored, oval shaped. And, uh, you know, they also cause those blank heads that you can see in this picture. Uh, so, so when do they occur? When do we first start seeing, seeing this damage occur? And you can see there of, of almost 60% of the time we first see damage show up in the field is three to four tiller and also five to six tiller at green ring and boot, it's rare that we see damage start. Typically it's gonna start right there mid tiller. Uh, and as far as your percent risk of infestation, so this is based off surveys uh, our PhD students done, Chase Floyd the past couple of years. And it seems like if there's a tree line anywhere around the field, uh, that these, these bill bugs have some kind of association with it and, and the damage is typically worse. Now, when it comes to like grassy turn rows, we have seen them feeding on like Bermuda turn rows, uh, particularly waiting on the rice. It seems like to get to the stage they want it, getting up to that three to four tiller. But if you have a tree line near row rice in any kind of history of bill bug, those, those fields I'd be pretty worried about. Um, and as far as occurrence, when we see the, the most adult activity, and so this was in Jackson County. This is right there in Old Trawl. Uh, you know, we see it that first week of June. It's been that way the past two years, within about three days of each other the past two years. And uh, the big thing to keep in mind about that is, uh, you know, that, that may not be the case all the way across the state, <clears throat> but it does seem like if you notice adults out in the field at a given time this year, you'll also see them going forward around that same time. Uh, so going back to these seed treatments, you know, we've done a lot of work with seed treatments over the past couple of years for rice bill bug. And, and like I said, you know, it seems like Dermacor for Tenza may, may come into play pretty big for them. Um, you know, I, I mentioned those blank heads earlier. And if you look here, I want to point out that, that blue bar on the left there, that's cruiser for Tenza. And if you look at that dark blue bar in the middle, that's our untreated. There's no pattern here. There's no rhyme or reason on these blank heads. Uh, it's all over the board. But once we put a combine in there, you know, that cruiser pretenza, numerically, it had the most blank heads. It's also got the highest yield in the test. And what you can also see here is you look at that, look at that uh, legend over there on the right. You start seeing those combinations creep up to the top. You also see Prevathon in there. You know, that's the same active as Dermacore, and it's used a lot. Um, it's used a lot on golf courses for, for general weevil control, uh, larvae control. So we've been trying it a little bit. It's not currently labeled in rice, but we've been trying it for bill bugs. And it seems like there may be some play there, but uh, we've yet to find a good timing for a foliar insecticide in general for a uh, rice bill bug. 
But, you know, we look at it again, same similar treatment set here, but we look at it for damaged tillers. And once again, you start seeing that if you add in that, that cruiser for tensor, cruiser dermacore, nips it for tensor, nips it dermacore, those combinations, we start seeing a pretty good reduction there in tiller feeding compared to the untreated or cruiser or nips it alone. And once again, it's the same trend once we get to yield. So if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna grow, grow rice and I'm worried about rice bill bugs, which based on what we've seen the past couple of years in a bad location or in a, in a bad population, they can cause somewhere between 25 and 30 bushels of, of yield loss. And granted, most of that's gonna be on the top end of the field, but uh, you know, sometimes that top end of the field, that, that top zone that doesn't hold water or stay muddy, uh, that can be a pretty significant portion of that field if I'm going to grow row rice, uh, I'm I'm going to I'm going to try to go with one of these combinations, and and you know a lot of times we get the question too on how much is it going to cost. Well, for tens on a hybrid, it's going to cost you about seven eight bucks, whereas Dermacore is going to be about twelve. Uh, for a conventional, they're going to be about the same. So it does cost quite a bit more money, but at the same time, I can make that pay for itself ninety five percent of the time, whether we're talking about furrow irrigated or uh, flooded rice. And so here are the folks that make all this work. This is a combination of uh, Gus and Ben's crew and mine. Uh, you know, we like to say it's the hardest working crew in Arkansas. And, and these kids put in a lot of work or a lot of hours for us every summer. Uh, I also want to thank the the uh, Arkansas Rice Checkoff for the funding of uh, most of this work you're seeing here. And with that, if you need to contact any of us, uh, I'm over in Stuttgart, Gus and Ben are over in Lone Oak and Glenn's up in Kaiser and here's all of our contact information if you need us. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Dr. Bateman. Uh, with that, I have, have one question I'd like to go ahead and throw your way right now. So on the, the furrow irrigated rice portion, so hybrid or variety, should they choose to, to reach out that far, kind of, if you're growing fertigated rice, are you adding Portenza kind of period as a recommendation? Yeah, especially on hybrid. I mean, it's definitely the cheaper option. I would go the Portenza route. They're the same price. They're both going to be between $18, $19 on, on the conventional side. So, you know, if you can get a deal on one or the other, I'd go that route. But either way, if I'm growing, if I'm growing row rice, I'm putting one of those diamides on that seed, on that seed. Okay, I'll throw you one more since it's closely related. Do different soil types have an effect on the level of infestation or damage caused by rice bill bug? So it does seem like we see a little bit more damage on some of our lighter soils, kind of in that White River region. But to be honest with you, some of the worst fields we walked in have been down in Southeast Arkansas and it's been super heavy clay. Uh, so you, you know, it, it doesn't seem like soil type has that big of a factor, but in most cases they do seem like they move a little further in the field whenever it's a little lighter soil texture. And that could be that it, it's not staying quite as muddy and just being able to go further into the field. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bateman. Again, further reminder, everybody to keep the questions coming and, and we'll catch up with any not already answered at the end. Next up, we have Dr. Yeshi Wamishi, Extension Rice Pathologist, and she's going to discuss rice fungicide management. Hello, this is Yeshi Wamishi, Extension Plant Pathologist for Division of Agriculture, University of Arkansas System. Today, I'll be talking on fungicide treatments of rice. For disease to occur, according to the plant disease triangle, there must be a susceptible host, there should be virulent pathogen and favorable environment in a given time. So to break this alignment of the triangle, then what we have to do is we have to use host resistance, best cultural practices, chemical or byproducts for disease management. These are our tools. And usually integrated approach is the best approach. And whether we use integrated approach or each tool separately, knowing the susceptibility or resistance level of your variety of choice is very important. And fungicides should not be applied automatically. And we discourage uh, from automatic fungicide application. 
and there must be reasons to justify the use of fine size. For example, if your field has got extensive history of a disease, and particularly under favorable weather conditions, and if your variety is susceptible, and your field has high yield potential, so you don't want to lose uh, yield because of uh, uh, the disease effect, and uh, your rice is being grown for seed production, or your rice is planted late, because late season, you know, there are so many uh, diseases that affect rice. And if you are uh, planning also uh, the rice to return, then uh, uh, use of fungicide is justifiable. So in Arkansas, there are about 25 uh, uh, known diseases that occur, uh, not all in, in one field, but across the fields. And among these, only four of them so far were very important for us to uh, use fungicides. Sheet blight, blast, kernel smut, and force smut. And recently, because of the wet and cold conditions, narrow brown leaf spot has become of concern. So if we start with sheath blight, and we know that sheath blight affects the sheath, the, the leaf, uh, reducing the surface area for photosynthesis. It affects the stem, weakening the stem, and causing lodg lodging, and it also affects the head and reducing the, the yield directly. And it produces also sclerotia to overwinter, and that overwinter sclerotia also will be affecting our next crop in rotation. So we have to control this disease or suppress this disease. And uh, due to that, uh, you know, uh, we have to determine the threshold because uh, uh, the threshold has been established for this disease. So 50% positive stops for uh, varieties which are uh, moderately susceptible and 35% positive stop for varieties which are susceptible or very susceptible are the threshold. And uh, these are given in MP192, you can refer to that. And again, your decision should not be based on what you see at the edge of the field, because at the edge of the field, what happens is usually it is dense because of uh, double drilling. And uh, also there might be some overlap of uh, uh, nitrogen application. So the disease may look severe. So you have to walk to the center of the field and make some stops, about 40 stops after every uh, 50 steps, and then determine the threshold. And if possible, look at the weather also. And if the weather is not favoring the disease, then delaying the fungicide application is economical because it is not uh, paying to spray or to apply the fungicide uh, for uh, sheath blight alone more than one time. So uh, some years back we did uh, experiment and uh, uh, with the timing. So we had uh, unsprayed check and sprayed at PD and sprayed at uh, uh, boot stage. And the boot application actually gave uh, the highest yield and also the, uh, the lowest, I mean, the lowest uh, disease uh, also was uh, uh, in the in the boot uh, application generally. So the other disease is uh, blast, and uh, blast is very destructive disease, and yield uh, up to near one hundred percent can be uh, can result out of uh, uh, blast if not protected. And so leaf blasts may or may not need fungicide application. For example, here you can see there is leaf burn down. And in this case, you know, seedlings may die and there might be some loss. But uh, a spot application is usually uh, recommended when it comes to fungicides. But the late season blasts, such as neck blast, panic blast, and uh, collar blast are uh, the most devastating and protective fungicide is uh, uh, recommended. And when we say protective, then it has to be applied early on before the disease occurs. So the uh, early scouting 
of the leaf blast uh, will uh, make us proactive to plan for uh, fungicide uh, application. So uh, we have to know our cultivar and uh, the field history, and we have to know also where to scout. Uh, so that you know the, we will not walk across uh, uh, all fields. So drier edges of the field, levees or tree lines, or wh wherever there is you know high ground in the field, or there is wherever there is an overlap of uh, nitrogen application. And once you suspect that uh, there is uh, uh, there might be some blasts. Uh, it is always wise to flag that area and so that you can go back until you confirm that it is actually blast with the typical symptoms. And once we, you know that the typical symptomatic blast is there, uh, usually found in the lower leaves, then you have to raise the flood depth. And by raising the flood depth, uh, the leaf blasts can be suppressed to some extent and spore production also will be reduced. But we have to be proactive to uh, plan for the uh, fungicide application for the let season uh, neck blast. So uh, I'm using uh, head out to say that how much of the panicle uh, has got out of the boot and head out does not refer to heading. So the, usually the first application is done between lead boot to 10% head out, and the second application is done between 50% to 75% head out. Meaning that the part of, I mean the neck and part of the panicle should still be within the boot. So once the necks are out, then we don't benefit from the fungicide application. It is just a waste of money. So another disease, which is very similar to uh, blasts uh, because it produces or uh, develops different races. And also it is a lead season kind of disease, uh, which uh, affects the panic from panicle emergence to maturity. And it's called the narrow blight uh, narrow brown uh, leaf spot. And so the spots look like the uh, brown spot, but they are oval in shape or they are elliptical uh, in shape. And sometimes you may not even see these uh, uh, spots on the leaves. The effect may be seen on, on, the, on the pedicel or here on the neck and also on the panicle branches. And if we look very hard, we can also see them on the on the seas. So there are uh, resistant varieties uh, that have been identified in uh, LSU and Texas, and propiconazole fungicides are uh, the major fungicides that are uh, uh, recommended for for them. And I'll I'll, uh, I'll be discussing about the uh, timing of uh, uh, the fungicide application for the NBLS uh, in the next uh, maybe one or two slides. So this disease, uh, the next disease is uh, kernel smut. And kernel smut, it can get very nasty if there is a field history. And if our cultural practice, particularly if we're applying excessive nitrogen and high seeding rate, you know, the condition might be very bad. Uh, depending on the weather. It likes wet and warm, uh, uh, wet condition and warm temperature. And so cultural practice uh, alone has more value than the fungicide alone. But the two together will give us the adequate uh, uh, result. So when it comes to the fungicides, again, you know, kernel smut is more sensitive than the force smut. And force smut, uh, it shows very conspicuously in the field and it looks nasty. And some people say that uh, it is a high yield disease. And because, you know, uh, again, uh, excess nitrogen uh, is added and, uh, and also history matters in this case. And, but unfortunately, this uh, fungus is not 
as sensitive as the kernels might. And because of that, uh, we are having more and more of uh, uh, force match every year in all varieties, conventional as well as uh, hybrid. So when it comes to the timing of fungicide application for the uh, SMATs, early boot to mid boot is the re recommended timing. And it is uh, usually you know, confusing to identify the early boots to mid boot stage. But if you just like determine from uh, uh, PD, panicle differentiation, like seven to 10 days, the early boot may start. And uh, you know, about like 14 days, maybe mood, uh, uh, mid boot may start. So the optimum timing is mid boot. And it is just before the full swelling of the, 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 the boots. So this is actually a full boot and then let boot, then, uh, you know, uh, boot split and it continues like that. So this is like a summary for the timing of fungicide application for the five diseases. Blast can be applied from let boot to 75% head out. I'm, I'm telling you head out. Uh, again, is not heading, okay? And sheath blight from mid boot to let boot, kernel smut from early boot to mid boot, and force smut, same as the kernel smut, and narrow brown leaf spot. If planted late, we have to go with fungicide early. If planted at uh, mid, then mid boot. And if planted uh, early, maybe you know we can go late because this disease is usually severe as the season and the crop gets late. So I got this information from Louisiana, but if we get the funding, we start working on the uh, fungicide timing uh, on narrow brown leaf spots that's caused by Cercospora. So as to the uh, fungicide uh, uh, sources, for Arkansas rice, uh, you can refer to the 2020 Arkansas Plant Disease Control Product Guide. And on page 19, uh, there are fungicide for seed dressing and page 20 for foliar application. And I have not talked about the seed dressing, but seed dressing is very important, particularly for early planted rice, and uh, which are actually suffering the early season. So the seed dressing fungicide should be combined with insecticides. Uh, so that is a, a vital point as well. So another experiment that we have been doing the last two years was a water volume. What water volume is actually good for uh, adequate coverage and uh, to decrease the disease and increase the, the yield. So we have seen that uh, the more the water, so we, we actually used for our experiment purpose, three gallon per acre, 10 gallon per acre and 20 gallon per acre. So uh, up to, uh, I mean, 10 gallon, 20 gallon, they gave, they gave us almost uh, similar results, but the three gallon was not significantly different uh, from the unsprayed check when it comes to disease as well as uh, a yield. So with uh, uh, unspread 161 and 3 GPA 184, 179, and when it comes to 10 GPA, the yield has increased. And uh, we're not recommending for the farmers to use 20 GPA, that's not uh, uh, feasible, but going up to 10 GPA and a minimum of five GPA is adequate as recommended uh, before. So we have to follow the guidelines. If we have to do it, let's do it right. Coverage is uh, vital for adequate results, not only for COVID, but for our rice from their respective uh, diseases. So now the checklists for to spray or not to spray. What is the reaction of my variety to the major disease that I have in my field? Which disease has major impact on, in my field? And are conditions favorable, favorable for disease development? What's uh, happening in my neighbor's field? Talk with, you, with your neighbors. What's going on in that field? 
Is my agronomic management plan helping or hurting the disease development? Is my fungicide timing correct? Or is it too early or too late? At what growth stage is my rice? What will fungicide application cost me? That is important to have a cost benefit analysis. Which fungicide should I use? What rate gives the best suppression? And what volume of water gives the good coverage? Is a fungicide justified for my field? That is, is the field profitable? And you have to know that the purpose of fungicide application should be to make money, not to lose money. And my final notes. Fungicides prevent yield losses due to diseases. They should not be used as yield enhancers. Fungicides are not 100% effective in controlling diseases and fungicide application are expensive and if not managed correctly, they may not pay for themselves. So with that, I would like to acknowledge University of Arkansas for the opportunity given to us and the Rice Board or the Rice Takeoff for the financial support to do our experiments and also our industry supporters uh, for their financial help as well as other collaborations. Thank you very much. Thank you for that update, Dr. Momishi. Uh, next on the program, we have Dr. Trent Roberts, Extension Soil Specialist, and he's going to discuss some rice fertility recommendations. Dr. Roberts. Hello, my name is Trent Roberts and I'm an associate professor with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. And today my topic is going to be rice nutrient management. So as a brief topical outline, we're going to start out discussing nutrients limiting Arkansas rice production. We're going to talk about nutrient budgeting and how that influences rice yield as well as profitability. We're going to talk about nutrient management in fertigated rice which will roll into overall zinc management and then end with poultry litter value. So first off, if we just think about what our common nutrient deficiencies are going to be in Arkansas rice production, we have to start with nitrogen. So in the majority of our soils, nitrogen is gonna be the most limiting nutrient and it's gonna to have to be applied in the greatest quantities in order to maximize not only our yield, but our productivity and our profitability. Phosphorus, can be both limiting at high and low pHs, and so we need to adjust accordingly. Potassium, especially on our lighter textured soils, is gonna be an issue to maximize our, our rice yield. And then zinc can be an issue both at very high and very low soil pHs. So if we think about fertilization, economics, and productivity, you know, our rice management system encompasses a lot of different facets. And fertilization is just one piece of that puzzle. But what we have to understand is that fertilization plays a big role ultimately in our return on investment and the overall profitability of our production system. So if you look at the 2021 Cooperative Extension Service Crop Enterprise, Crop Enterprise Budget for Rice, we see that anywhere from 20 to 25% of that production budget is associated just with fertilization. And here what I've done is pulled out the recommendation that's included for phosphorus and potassium. And what I'll remind you is that it is for a medium soil test P and a medium soil test K. So what we find is that recommendation is a 0, 50, 60 in terms of nitrogen, P205 and K2O. And the cost of that would be roughly $28.40 per acre. So this is set as the default in our rice crop enterprise budget. And so if you just go in there and look at that number, this is the number that it's going to be using as its estimate. Now what I want to do is break that down a little bit further. And so in this, what we're looking at is the associated P and fertilizer cost for our University of Arkansas recommendations when we have a pH of greater than 6.5. Everyone should be familiar with the fact that our phosphorus recommendations are broken up into pH greater than 6.5 and pH less than 6.5. So what I chose to do was use the pH greater than 6.5 because those are higher rates uh, than the others. So I don't want to use the term worst case scenario, 
but these costs would be higher due to the higher application rates associated with the increased soil pH. So over here on the left hand side, we have our soil test categories and we have the associated P205 application rates. Across the, the top, we have our soil test potassium categories and our associated K2O fertilization rates. And then what we have is the cost associated with each of those coordinated application rates. So what you can see here is from the previous slide, I mentioned that the crop enterprise budget assumes you have a medium soil test P and a medium soil test K. So that associated cost for those nutrients would be roughly $28.40 per acre. Now, part of the reason I included this slide and I wanna spend time on it is if you look, the soil test lab at Mariana, the most common recommendation that they give out is for low soil test P and low soil test K. So what that means is if you just use the default in our crop enterprise budgets, chances are you're actually underestimating the cost of applying both your phosphorus and potassium fertilizers. And so what I wanted to do was just provide this table to you so that you can kind of see how changing, you know, not only your phosphorus soil test concentration or category and the associated application rate, as well as your potassium is going to influence the costs associated with fertilization. Now, one thing to remember is that as we get to our low and very low soil test categories, those are the two categories where we would expect the greatest magnitude of yield response as well as, well as the greatest probability of yield response. So those are the ones where we would expect the greatest return on investment for these particular application rates. The second thing that I want to emphasize is when you're using those crop production budgets, specifically for fertilization, you know, sometimes that default value is going to work for you. But if you want to get a true indication of how your fertilization program is impacting your profitability, you really need to go in and actually put your actual soil test concentration uh, related uh, P205 and K2O rates in there to see what it's going to cost you. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and start talking about nutrient management and fur irrigated rice production. And I think the first thing we need to do is talk about soil pH and how it's impacted by flooding versus non-flooded conditions. So when we flood rice in a traditional direct seeded delayed flood production system, we have to understand that regardless of where we start in terms of our soil pH, the longer we keep that flood on, the more neutral the soil pH is going to become. So for instance, you know, if we start out at a pH of five and a half and we apply a permanent flood, over time our soil pH is going to creep upwards uh, to around seven or so. If we have a high pH of 7.8 and we apply a permanent flood, you know, over time it's going to tend to de decrease towards neutrality. You know, why that's important is the majority of our uh, soil uh, provided nutrients are going to be most available at a pH of around 6.5 or near neutral. Now, when we look at upland crops or non flooded conditions, the pH tends to remain at whatever the soil pH is. It can trend towards the irrigation water. So, if we have surface water, which might be slightly more acidic, then our soil pH might become more acidic, or if we are using irrigation water uh, that's groundwater and it may have a higher pH, then those soil pHs may trend upwards towards that high pH or basic irrigation water. We have to understand that those changes in pH might increase or decrease our nutrient availability. So just to further emphasize that point, you know, this is a chart that basically relates nutrient availability to changes in soil pH. And what we find is that for most elements, at very low pH or very high pH, we tend to have low availability of those nutrients. The second thing is that around this six and a half pH range is where most of our nutrients tend to be highly available. And so a lot of times we consider that our target pH uh, for soil management. As we increase above this, right, most elements, we, we tend to see a decrease in availability. As we go below this, most elements, we tend to see a decrease in availability. So if we think about phosphorus in particular, we have to understand that phosphorus is gonna be less available at high pH and low pH. 
So the further from 6.5 that we move either up or down, the less available phosphorus becomes. And what this really has to do with is the solubility of the compounds that phosphorus forms in the soil. As we get more acidic, phosphorus tends to precipitate out with aluminum, which is highly insoluble. As we start to get higher pH, phosphorus tends to precipitate out in calcium forms that are much less available. If we think about how flooding the soil impacts phosphorus management, you have to understand that flooding the soil is going to increase pea availability. And the longer the soil is flooded, the more available that pea is going to become. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if we have a soil that has a given soil test pea concentration, if I grow a rice crop that's flooded, the phosphorus in that soil is gonna be more available to the rice under a flooded condition than it might be to a soybean or a corn crop grown on that exact same soil in the upland condition. So we haven't really changed the soil test concentration of phosphorus. What we've changed is the availability of phosphorus that actually exists in the soil. And we won't get into you know, the dynamics of that, but ultimately those reduced soil conditions that come with the establishment and maintenance of a permanent flood is what leads to that increased pea availability. So how does this impact nutrient management in furrow irrigated rice? Well, here's what we can tell you. In furrow irrigated rice, where we use a more of an upland type production system, we don't maintain you know, a permanent flood on the entire field, and we have more upland growing conditions, we know that phosphorus is gonna be less available in those situations. So what that means is that whatever our soil test recommends is the minimum amount of phosphorus that we need to apply, because we know the soil availability of phosphorus is gonna be reduced under those non-flooded or upland conditions. We don't have enough data right now to really make changes to our recommendations for fur irrigated rice. We feel confident that our current soil test P recommendations for conventionally flooded rice will work, but it's certainly not something we need to consider cutting. If you're growing furrow irrigated rice, please follow your soil test phosphorus recommendations and use that as the minimum P205 application rate. If we think about potassium and how fur irrigated or upland conditions might impact its availability, it really shouldn't change much. If anything, fur irrigated rice uh, systems might change the loss mechanisms a little bit in terms of leaching or runoff, but they should not be substantial. I think our main concern with fur irrigated rice and potassium management is how it might impact other factors. And so the one thing that we do know is that potassium is very tightly linked to disease pressure. And so what we find is that a lot of times when we have you know, hidden hunger or deficient potassium, we have an increase in disease susceptibility or disease severity. Well, when we also remove the permanent flood from a rice production system, we can have an increase in disease pressure. So what I'm alluding to here is the removal of the permanent flood in a fur irrigated rice system is already going to increase our disease pressure. So the last thing that we want is to exacerbate those conditions by potentially having potassium deficiency as well. So in those fur irrigated rice systems, you know, similar to what we said about phosphorus, those K2O application rates that are given on your soil test recommendation are really the minimum amount that you need to apply because we don't want to have to deal with uh, diseased in, or increased disease pressure from the lack of a flood, and then have you know, our plant more susceptible to that disease because we're experiencing K deficiency. The last thing I wanna talk about in terms of a specific nutrient is zinc. It's very, very important for rice production. One thing that you'll find is that we break up our zinc recommendation into high pH and low pH soils, so greater than 6.0 and less than 6.0. When we have those higher pH soil conditions, zinc tends to be less available in the soil, and therefore we recommend 10 pounds of actual zinc be soil applied all the way out through the medium soil test category.
when we have more acidic soil conditions or pH uh, less than 6.0, you can see that the soil zinc is going to be more available. And so therefore, we're only going to recommend zinc applications when we're in that very low soil test category. So what does that tell us? Zinc availability is tightly linked to soil pH. And when we have higher pH, we reduce zinc availability. And so therefore, we require larger zinc application rates to overcome that deficiency. Now, when we start talking about furrow irrigated rice, we really have to understand that this is kind of a new and emerging production system and there are a lot of unknowns, but the experiences that we have in flooded rice systems can tell us a lot about what we should expect. And so if we think about a traditionally direct seeded delayed flood production system, you know, when do we experience or when do I, I typically identify zinc deficiencies in rice? Well, if we have very, very severe deficiencies, you know, there's a chance that those can be diagnosed pre-flood, but that's pretty rare. You've got to have a, a pretty significant zinc deficiency in order to elucidate enough stunting, tiller, you know, lack of tillering or bronzing to identify a zinc deficiency pre-flood. The majority of the time when we're identifying zinc deficiencies, it's once we've applied our pre-flood nitrogen and we flooded up the field, that's typically when we start to identify those zinc deficiencies. Well, why is that? Zinc is very important for oxygen movement and transport in the plant. And essentially, if you have a zinc deficiency and you apply that permanent flood, you're suffocating the rice plant. And so that's why when it goes bad, it goes bad quickly. That's also why one of our primary salvage um, approaches is to remove the flood and allow that rice to catch its breath. So if you think about those two things that we know about conventionally flooded rice, you know, the big concern that we have is without the permanent flood, will we be able to identify and correct mild or moderate zinc deficiencies? Because in a lot of cases, I, I think in mild and moderate zinc deficiencies, we don't know they're out there until we apply that permanent flood and we really stress that rice and put it in a situation where we can make it obvious. Once again, like I said, with phosphorus and potassium, we need to follow those soil test zinc application rates and we need to be very proactive about zinc management and ferro irrigated rice. And it's really due to the fact that my primary concern is we could have a lot of hidden hunger associated with furrow irrigated rice that we don't properly diagnose because we don't stress it or push it to the point where we would see those deficiencies like we might in a traditionally direct seeded delayed flood production system. So now just overall zinc management. I really wish we could start moving towards more proactive soil applied zinc management. You know, typically, if you're in those categories that require zinc, it's going to recommend 10 pounds of actual zinc soil applied. We're most often going to use a granular zinc sulfate, which equates to about 33 pounds of product per acre. And the cost associated with that is oftentimes a very hard pill to swallow. When you think about 25 or $30 per acre just for zinc, that doesn't count what you might need in terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. The one thing that I really want to drive home here is that this is a big price tag, but in four applications, we can typically move your soil test zinc concentration from the low to the optimum soil test category. And what that means is once we move into that optimum category, chances are it's going to be several years before we have to apply zinc again. We don't necessarily know how long that's going to be because it's going to vary from field to field and system to system. But the point I'm trying to make is a proactive approach with soil applied zinc is truly one of those scenarios where you're putting money or you're putting nutrients into your soil bank that you're going to be able to take advantage of for years and years to come. Now, unfortunately, yeah, that's about a hundred dollar per acre price tag, but what's the alternative? Well, if you truly need zinc, you need it in order to maximize your yield and productivity. So if you don't do 10 pounds of soil applied zinc, what's the alternative? Well, it's gonna be one pound of foliar applied zinc. We typically use a chelated spray, which is gonna 
roughly cost the same amount, $25 to $28 per acre. The problem with foliar zinc applications is they have almost no impact on soil test zinc concentrations. And so really they're band-aids. Yes, they fix the problem. Yes, they allow you to either recover yield loss or maximize yield potential you know, in a traditional system. But it's a band-aid because it's something you have to do every time you grow rice in that particular field. The more proactive we can be with just general zinc management in rice, I think the better off we're gonna be. But especially in furrow irrigated rice, we need to get ahead of the curve. Last topic I wanna to talk about real quick, you know, that chicken poop is probably worth a lot more than you think. In the Delta, we're getting a vast increase in the availability and distribution of poultry production across the state. And what that means is greater opportunity for our producers to have access to and utilize poultry litter as a nutrient source. The one thing that I want people to understand is that if you look at the nutrient value that poultry litter contains more often than not, it has a higher value than what you're asked to pay for it. So what I've done here is tried to summarize what the value of various poultry litter sources are gonna be. So over here on the left-hand side, we have our nutrient analysis in N, P205, and K2O per ton for three different poultry litter sources that are commonly available in the Arkansas Delta. We've got them as the mean of samples that were submitted to the Arkansas Diagnostic Lab for broilers, hens, and pullets. If you can see here for broilers, the average of those samples submitted was a 61, 61, 55. Now the next columns, we have the fertilizer equivalent value if you were to purchase those nutrients as either urea, triple superphosphate, or potash. And then in the end, we just sum up that nutrient value. So you can see here that our nitrogen is grayed out. And so a lot of times with poultry litter, depending on your production system and your crop, you can count 25% of that for rice production, and you can count about 50% of that for upland crops, such as corn or cotton. Whether or not you count that is why we have that grayed out. So that's really up to you what percentage of that nitrogen you count towards the value of the poultry litter. If we consider, right, the P and the K, you know, a broiler, an average broiler litter is going to have a value for just the phosphorus and potassium of about $41, $42 per ton. If we include all of the nitrogen, then that value jumps all the way up to almost $65 per ton. And so the only thing I'm trying to emphasize here is, one, poultry litter is an excellent nutrient source. You know, the majority of the nutrients are almost immediately plant available. If we look at the value of the nutrients contained in poultry litter compared to what it would cost us to buy those in commercial fertilizer sources, more often than not, right, the value of those nutrients contained in poultry litter is going to be greater than what we're asked to pay for it. If you're purchasing poultry litter, I'm going to encourage you to always get an analysis, one, so you can calculate the true value of your poultry litter, but two, so that you know what you're applying and you can make adjustments, you know, to either your fertilizer recommendation to supplement with commercial P and K, or just to make sure you have an understanding of the rate of nutrients that you're applying. So to wrap up with some key takeaways, you know, just remember that our fertilization practices and our fertilizer budgeting are gonna be tightly linked to our rice yield and our profitability. So we need to pay close attention to what those nutrients are actually costing us and what we're getting in terms of our return on investment. With furrow irrigated rice, we have to make sure that we soil test. We also have to make sure that we apply the P, K, and zinc as the minimum rates based on those soil test concentrations. Cutting P, K, and zinc to me are not an option in furrow irrigated rice production. There's a lot more wiggle room in traditional delayed flood rice production. To me, those aren't nutrients you want to consider cutting when you're thinking about furrow irrigated rice. You know, zinc is going to be very critical for high yielding rice. And poultry litter is an excellent nutrient source if you have access to it. So just a couple key things to remember. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge the support of the Arkansas Rice Research Promotion Board. Everything I discussed today was a direct result 
of research funds provided through their checkoff program. I would like to thank the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture, as well as my soil fertility crew for the countless hours that they've spent working on the research that we've presented today. Lastly, I know we're gonna have a question and answer session, but I wanted to put up my email and cell phone number. If you ever have any type of nutrient related issues in any of our row crops, please feel free to reach out to me and I wish you all the best 2021 that we can have. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. I'll throw one or two questions your way here before we move on to our last segment. The first question is, how much potash would you recommend just prior to planting if you're in the low soil test category? Okay, Jared, thanks for the question. I would just remind everybody to uh, remember that the this type of information is listed in our rice production manual, as well as our rice quick facts that are uh, sent out each spring prior to the beginning of the growing season. But in that low soil test category, we would recommend 60 units of K2O be applied immediately pre-plant uh, and incorporated when able. All right, one more. Uh, what about sulfur deficiencies? Have you seen any of those? So we're getting more and more questions related to sulfur deficiencies. Um, I think the first thing that I would remind people is where we're most likely to see sulfur deficiencies. Those are going to occur on our very coarse textured soils, so sandy soils with low soil organic matter. Uh, soil organic matter is really the source of sulfur in the majority of our soils, so that's where it, it's going to be a problem is the lack of organic matter is, is typically what's going to lead to sulfur deficiencies. Um, I think they are becoming a little more uh, widespread or uh, we're pushing our yields to the point where they're becoming more evident. Um, I think, you know, the typical areas we need to focus and think about managing sulfur um, are going to be, right, those areas in the field where we get textural changes from, you know, traditional rice soils to sandier, you know, coarser textured soils. And I think one thing that, that's becoming an issue is areas where we have uh, soil layers um, or sandy soil layers that aren't exposed at the surface, right? So you may have heavy clay that's visible on top, but you've got a sand streak underneath that you can't see. And unfortunately, those are hard to identify until you actually see the deficiency. And then once, you know, we see it, we might be able to say, okay, well, it's a subsoil issue that we need to be aware of. Um, but unfortunately, there's not a real proactive way to identify those areas. But, but really, soil texture and organic matter are what we need to consider. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Again, some more questions in for him as well that we'll, we'll get to at the very end. Next up, uh, we have our, our final presentation. You're going to have to hear from me again, along with Mr. Justin Klopechka, PhD student. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about furrow irrigated rice. Hey, it's Jared Hardke again. And uh, with me for this presentation is Mr. Justin Klopechka, PhD student working in rice with myself and Dr. Trent Roberts. And we're going to talk a little bit today about furrow irrigated rice. So really over the past few years, uh, the percentage of adoption in the state of Arkansas for irrigated rice or FIR or row rice uh, certainly really been on the increase. Uh, we saw the first big jump around 2016. And if you're depending on how you want to look at it, the, the yellow bars are the total acres shown. And then the, the white line shown there is actually the, the percent of the acres within the given year. So any which way you want to look at it, Definitely been been climbing dramatically. Our current estimate was that in 2020, around 14% uh, or about 200,000 acres of furrow irrigated rice was grown in the state of Arkansas. And, and at least at this time, based on results again in 2020, we do expect that number to, to at least continue to increase to some degree going into 2021. A few management considerations to keep in mind, something we kind of like to touch on every year, just as a, a general reminder, we are shooting for shallow beds. They're really just tall enough to hold water. So we, we want to watch out for those fields that maybe have a, a little more cross slope, uh, that, that we're going to have a harder time keeping the water in the furrow and keep it from jumping beds. So that, you know, that would be a restriction where you really need some taller beds, if say it were in soybean, to keep them in the furrows. 
that might not be a field that's ideal for fur irrigated rice. Um, using old soybean beds is certainly an option and, and has proven to work very well when we can avoid uh, ruts, which we did uh, in, in a number of situations finally uh, in 2020, whereas the previous few years that really wasn't an option. Our preferred bed width overall is roughly 30 inches on a loamy type soil or about 38 inches on a clay. We can certainly go wider than that, but the risk increases. And when we've seen people try, say, a you know a 36, getting beyond 36 inches to say a 40 inch bed on a loamy type soil, really start to run into some problems getting water all the way to the center of the bed. And the same is going to be true on a clay soil as we start getting a lot wider than a 38 some more difficulty, but the clay is certainly going to be more forgiving than, than a loamy type soil of, of getting a little too wide. We obviously strongly want to encourage the use of pipe planter, uh, computerized hole selection of some sort to, to be more efficient in our irrigation efforts and in blocking at the bottom of the field to, to back some water up and really contain as much water as we can stand to, to a depth that the young rice can stand within the field is all going to make us a little bit better at our fur irrigated rice effort. We really want to focus on avoiding water stress around the green ring to half inch interval elongation timing. So that, that's, that's really a key period for when we're forming grain. Uh, the number of kernels and, and panicle branches that we're going to have is determined at that time. And water stress can be one of the factors that can hurt that formation. And then, of course, flowering through grain fill, great concerns there when we're actually finally filling the grain and making it. Uh, we can hurt ourselves again with, with moisture deficit stress. A lot of questions, there's certainly not much work at this point on it, but from a, from a general standpoint, we want to drain late. Obviously, we're, we're not truly draining the majority of the field because most of it's fur irrigated, except for maybe the bottom where we're holding water. But we, we want to make one more irrigation after the normal drain date. Whenever you would think the field would be ready to drain, you can make one more because that profile is not saturated the same way it is when we're going, growing a flooded rice environment. However, if we are backing water up at the bottom of the field, it may be that we can go ahead and turn that water loose at about a normal drain time. And then just then, then that next kind of last irrigation that kind of comes in after that, will certainly just kind of roll right on out of the field, but that'll help us get dried up and firmed up where we can hopefully even have a, a more efficient harvest this way as well. We have done some small plot variety trials the past couple of years uh, in irrigated rice systems. The, the ones here, uh, REC at the Rice Research and Extension Center at Stuttgart, as well as an on-farm location in Monroe County, again, focusing on loamy soils at this point. But there, there's certainly quite a bit to look at. We basically what we do is we plant you know, replicated versions of these of all these varieties, but we put one at the very top of the field, right up next to the pipe, and then one at the very bottom. Uh, and again, both of these, uh, every, each one of these field sites each year, we, you know, we were backing up water at the bottom, so it turned into more of a flood. More and more as the season went on, the rice got bigger, and we could hold more water. And, and certainly you can see that in regards to whether we're talking varieties, uh, you know, long grain varieties, medium grains, or, or even the hybrids, the bottom end of the field doing a lot better than the top end of the field. Certainly again, the anything we're putting right up against the pipe within that first 50, 100 feet is going to be more difficult to uh, adequately manage, whether that's the, the fertilizer component or especially the water and getting the beds to wick being right up there near the pipe. And in some cases, obviously the cold water effect having that, that impact right there. And as you move out to the middle of the field and get away from it, we expect that to improve and certainly be a lot better at the bottom where it's a lot more like a flood. So if we kind of jump over to kind of the mean, which is the average across all the top and bottom numbers that you see there. Uh, certainly, we, we, we want to be a very, very careful with the varieties uh, that, that we're not putting them in situations that are too stressful than they can handle. Some of their yields do look very good at the bottom ends of the fields, but they certainly leave a lot to be desired near the top. And so that's where we're, we're going to struggle with making sure we get them uh, adequate nitrogen and adequate water should you choose to put a variety in that situation but we can pick out some varieties that did perform certainly a lot better overall 
uh, relative to the hybrids that, that still look pretty strong, whether that was top or bottom of the field and, and the medium grain varieties looked okay as well. So that kind of leads us to, uh, you know, still a similar level of recommendation to what we've held in the past. And that is that, you know, kind of the hybrids in general, 753, uh, 7521 full page, uh, and, and others are still looking to be the safest, most, you know, more consistent yielders. However, some of the varieties do maintain kind of the, the general difference in yield that, that we expect even in a flooded environment of around the 20 bushel an acre difference particularly with CLL 16 and CLL 17. Uh, and at times even, even Jupiter is a medium grain, but, but we did see a little bit more actually just kind of, you know, in infield observation, uh, the stress that, that CLL 15 and Jupiter dealt with in a row rice environment and, and, you know, especially on some steeper fields uh, or where we couldn't manage the, the, the water and maybe the fertility is adequately, they did have a few more problems. And as you start moving further down the list and talk about diamond, PBLO2, Cinema 4, and even unhindered Roygen things, it's not just the, the water stress and just the environment stress, but also increasing blast concerns as well, trying to grow those without any flood present. So we're still gonna lean toward the hybrids first from a recommendation standpoint, there are varieties that, that can and will be players in a fur irrigated system, but we're certainly gonna wanna lean towards those fur irrigated fields that are, again, perhaps the easy way to think about it is maybe more shallow sloped, uh, more easy to uniformly manage is where we're gonna consider maybe putting, you know, one of the varieties there. But again, keeping in mind those, those uh, the, those three clear field varieties all have blast resistance genes, so that they don't have complete resistance, but they're certainly a lot safer than a lot of other offerings. But we do still, again, from a variety standpoint, have some, some just general stress concerns that we have to be able to help them withstand. And keep in mind, this list is not complete by any means. These are just in here for examples. There are other varieties and hybrids out there that, that are going to fall into various categories here. Uh, but without trying to grab them all at once, this, this covers a lot of the major bases. And with that, I'm going to swap over and let Justin uh, visit with you a little bit about his portion. All right, thank you, Dr. Harkey. I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here in front of you guys. I know that we all kind of wish that we were in person, but I'm, I'm still thankful for the opportunity to be here and present some of the research we've been working on over the past two or three years. So let's look at some irrigation trials that we actually looked at in 2018 and 2019. We looked at two different sites. We, we uh, did these at Pine Tree, which is around Colt in St. Francis County. Then we also did them at the Northeast Research and Extension Center, which is at Kaiser over in Mississippi County. And uh, we looked at those two differences because uh, obviously Pine Tree is more of a Callaway silt loam and then Kaiser is a uh, more clay, sharky clay soil type. We use, um, the reason that I've got these plot dimensions in here is that we, we tried to mimic the fur irrigated rice commercial situation. You know, we've got 650 foot long plots at Pine Tree, 1250 foot plot, quarter mile runs at Northeast Research and Extension Center. We're just trying to get um, as realistic of an idea as we can of um, while looking at this research situation. So looking at grain yield at these irrigation trials, um, what we've got here is grain yield, um, obviously in bushels per acre on the Y axis, then the X axis is gonna be our treatments. Um, what you can see here is that the top of the field, the, so the top one third of the field was cut separately from the middle one third and then the bottom one third. So the top third would be in that red bar and then the uh, gray bars represent the middle third of the field and the white bars represent the bottom third of that field. And so one thing that I want to point out here is that um, you can see where we're lacking a little bit of yield in the top and middle thirds of the field for all of these irrigation treatments. Uh, but once you average these together, we're, we're probably looking at about 10 to 15 bushel difference between uh, our control, which was our conventional flood, and then our fur irrigated rice treatments. And one other thing I'd like to point out is that you see, um, it's pretty much looks like I've copy and pasted these three fur irrigated rice treatments. So it looked at regardless of which of these three thresholds we threw at it, um, up to a negative 45 centibar threshold with our watermark sensors, you can see that we were still looking at pretty much the same yield as if we were looking at the negative 15 treatment. Looking at head rice yield, we did not see any treatment differences, um, even among the furrow irrigated rice versus the conventional flood. But what we did see with the uh, furrow irrigated rice, 
was a difference in the area of the field. So between the top, middle, and one third of the field. We were looking at about 49% head rise is what we saw at the top of the field. We stepped that up to about 50 to 51% in the middle of the field and about 51 to 51 and a half percent at the bottom of the field. So we're looking at kind of a stepwise increase as we move to more water available. And especially once we get into that flooded environment, which is generally what we would expect. So, um, however, we're not looking at, you see, uh, we saw about a 3% head rise loss at the top of the field where there was no flood at all compared to the bottom of the field. So we are looking at a slight head rise, um, head rise loss with that loss of the flood. And then total rice, we kind of saw the same general trend, not, um, not near as significant, but we did see about a half a percent head rise, or excuse me, a half a percent total rice loss when we moved from the bottom of the field to the top of the field. Looking at irrigation water use in these same trials, we did see a significant um, decrease in irrigation usage, irrigation usage, especially as we moved into these treatments that were irrigating less frequently. So as we moved into that negative 45 centibar threshold, we used about two, two acre feet of water as compared to about three acre feet of water with our control, as well as the negative 15 treatment. So you can see um, numerically, we were actually using a little more water if we were irrigating with that negative 15 treatment, which was two to three times per week in the absence of rainfall. But however, we were able to save quite a bit of water if we were um, moving into, that, into those greater thresholds where we irrigated less frequently. And so what we saw again with these was fur irrigated rice does have the potential to yield with flooded rice pretty close up there, possibly 10 to 15 bushels off, especially at the top of the fields um, with our hybrids. And as you saw Dr. Hartke's talk earlier, it could be possibly be more than that with our varieties at the top of the field. The negative 45 centibar uh, threshold on these watermark sensors that we were using was an acceptable threshold. And I do want to point out that we were installing these at the top one third of the field and um, instead of the middle third or the bottom one third as you would do in soybeans, for instance. So we installed these at the top of the third, about a four inch depth. And what that is, we were looking at the main root zone of the rice crop when we installed it at that depth. And what we saw is irrigation about every five days was an acceptable schedule. That's pretty much what it boiled down to when we're looking at these watermarks. However, we do see um, the utility in still using these sensors as opposed to just going with a calendar schedule. For certain instances, such as um, what if we don't get an effective irrigation all the way through, or what if we get a half inch rainfall, what do you do? The, the soil moisture sensors really help to iron that out um, without just taking the guesswork out of it pretty much. And we're looking at the potential for 30 to 40% water savings with that, especially if we go with that negative 45 centibar threshold. We saw about 12 acre inches savings, um, which again is about 33% of the water that we would normally apply to a conventional flood. And now moving into a, a second aspect that we've been looking at over the past three years, and that's our nitrogen trials. And most of these were done um, in a commercial setting along with our, our cooperating producers. There were also a few that were done on research stations. We looked at 10 silt loam sites and all of these did have a 30 inch furrow spacing, which is what's recommended for a silt loam. And then we had five clay sites, which you, um, four of these utilized the 38 inch furrow spacing, and then one utilized the 76 inch furrow spacing. Uh, so again, three years, hybrid was grown at all sites. We did not use any varieties in these. They were mostly 753. There was also 17301, I believe. Uh, water was backed up in some of the fields, but not all of the fields. Some of these were steeper hillsides, and then some of them were more shallow grade. Looking at our nitrogen management structure, I just kind of want to breeze through this um, quickly. So what are treatments two through six that we looked at? Um, in that second column, that total nitrogen rate in pounds per acre, so we based treatments two through six on the nitrogen rate that you would normally apply to your flooded crop. And what we did was we split that anywhere from a single pre-irrigation pre application all the way up to a four-way split of that recommended nitrogen. And when we look at treatment seven through 10, um, treatment seven was a two-way split spaced a couple weeks apart. And then we added an additional application of 100 pounds of urea. Treatment eight was three shots of 100 pounds of urea spaced seven to 10 days apart. And treatment nine was an excessive single pre-flood. So we, we went with 210 pounds on a clay. It would have been about 180 pounds on a silt loam. And we went with that all pre-irrigation. Then treatment 10, we only added that in 2020, but that was looking at four shots of 100 pounds of urea. And what you can see with our grain yield, this graph here is for our clay sites in 2018 and 2019. So that's um, three or four sites averaged together here. Our rice grain yields on the y-axis, um, again, we've got top and bottom of the field. We, we split this into two zones. 
we had plots at the top of the field which were very close to the irrigation pipe then we had plots at the bottom of the field which were very um which were generally flooded however not in all situations but for all the clay uh, all, all the clay fields they were flooded at the bottom of the field and so what we saw here is that at the top of the field versus the bottom of the field we did not see much of a difference on our clay soils and actually with some of the treatments the top of the field actually averaged slightly better grain yield than the bottom of the field what we saw again um, very good grain yields 200 to 250 bushel per acre rice uh, what we saw um, i've got three treatments highlighted here the 25 25 50 split which is a general three-way split of that recommended fertilizer we've also got our four-way split and then we've got, however, the, the highest yield, both numerically um, for both the top and bottom of the field, was that two-way split that I mentioned earlier, plus the additional 100 pounds per acre of a urea, or I've got it labeled here, the 50-50-46. So on a clay soil, that would be 75 pounds um, up front and 75 pounds of nitrogen two weeks later, followed by 46 pounds of nitrogen about one week after that second application. And that was, again, averaging over 250 bushels per acre in these small plot trials. Looking at head rice yield, we kind of saw the same uh, stepwise effect as we moved into our uh, different splits. And again, we saw that 50-50 split plus the additional 46 pounds of nitrogen was our overall winner of the head rice yield at these sites. We did have one other um, that produced the optimal head rice yield, that being the 140% single pre-flood. Uh, we can kind of see that also because it is um, just the excessive in rate. It's um, more nitrogen than we put out in all these other treatments. So we would expect a slightly higher head rise yield with that also. Moving into grain yield, this is our 2020 uh, silt loam sites for grain yield. And you can see a silt loam, we had many more options. And the stars, what they represent is the highest, um, the highest yielders. So what you can see is that as long as we got pretty much out in a three-way split to a four-way split, or if we added additional nitrogen, that we did optimize yield in 2020. And actually, if you're looking at the 2018 and 2019 sites, there were even more treatments that were possible to optimize yield on the silt loam soils. Looking at head rice yield, we kind of see the same story. Um, head rice, both at the top and bottom of the field, was very similar with the majority of our treatments. It was also greater at the bottom of the field. That's one thing that I forgot to point out on the um, grain yield, that on the silt loam sites, the bottom of the field is producing greater grain yield and head rice yield at the majority of our situations. So just looking at some quick conclusions, the top option on the clay soils was that 75-75 split, um, plus the additional 46 pound per acre application at that um, one week after that second application. And we saw about an eight to 26 bushel per acre yield advantage from this application method versus just doing the two-way split of the single pre-flood without that additional 46 pound per acre application. Also, we saw that more options were able to maximize yield on our silt loam soils. We're looking at the four-way split, the 25% times four weeks. Also looking at the, the same option that we had in our clay soils, the 50-50 plus the 46 um, did a very good job on these soils. Another option that did very well for us was the three applications of 46 pounds per acre, which is three applications of 100 pounds of urea. That looks like one of the top options to us on our silt loam soils. And with that, I'd also like to give a quick plug to our fur irrigated rice handbook. This uh, just came out before the growing season this year. Um, what it is, is pretty much a lot of the management recommendations that, I've, that we went over in these slides, um, plus some additional recommendations. And with that, um, this is Dr. Hardkey's information. Um, feel free to give him a call or, or um, also sign up for some of the newsletters. Also some helpful links on the bottom. Also like to thank the Arkansas Rice Promotion Board, um, the Arkansas Rice uh, Checkoff, as well as the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture for funding for these research projects. Thank you guys. All right, thank you everyone. That's going to conclude our pre-recorded presentations. And before we move on to the, to the rest of the Q&A session, I'd like to take just a moment to thank all of our faculty, staff, and students for, for their efforts to improve rice production in Arkansas. And just as importantly, one more time uh, to thank the Arkansas Rice Producers and the Rice Checkoff Funds administered by the Rice Research and Promotion Board. All of the work you, you've seen here today wouldn't be possible without that support. And we hope these presentations help to demonstrate uh, those checkoff dollars at work. Also remember that uh, CEUs will be submitted after the meeting for those that provided their license numbers when they registered. If you did not provide those numbers, 
and do want to receive credit, please email that information to rice at uaex.edu. And now we're going to move on to the rest of the Q&A session. If you haven't already, please submit any questions you have in the question and answer box, and we'll do our very best to get to all the questions that, that we have time for today. Um, one that I'll go ahead and, and jump to, sorry, it moved on me, <laughs> uh, is for Dr. Roberts. How much P and K is available in poultry litter the first year? Okay, thanks for the question, Jared. Uh, for our recommendations and the litter types that we utilize in Arkansas, we assume that 100% of the P and K is immediately plant available in our poultry litter. So whatever your analysis says for P and K, we would assume uh, that that's gonna be plant available that season. Uh, I believe this is in reference to row rice. What is your recommendation on heavy soils where soil tests show sufficient K, but still seeing some deficiencies in the season, looking at possibly doing a 50-50 DAP and potash application prior to tillering? Uh, so I think that is a, a good approach. You know, a lot of times in rice, whether it's uh, traditionally flooded rice or furrow irrigated rice, we don't see a lot of our K deficiencies until we kind of get past, you know, uh, panicle initiation or panicle differentiation. And, and that's really when we start to see K deficiencies. And so that's a good time to think about, you know, putting out some potash. The other thing that I would mention is a lot of the work that Dr. Slayton and some of his students have completed recently has helped us uh, develop a critical in-season tissue concentration for uh, potash in rice. And we recommend that you sample the Y leaf, which is the uppermost collared leaf. And typically, you know, out to about the boot stage, as long as we can maintain 1.6% uh, K, we know that our potassium nutrition is adequate. So that is a new tool that we could potentially use to confirm whether or not these are actual K deficiencies. And so if you'd like more information on that tissue test and, and how to use it, uh, to diagnose potassium deficiency in season, please uh, reach out to me and, and we'll get you more information. All right. Thank you, Trent. I'll field one here from earlier in reference to harvest aids. The question was, uh, if we're trying to harvest three days after application, then why apply? Uh, really, the goal there is particularly with higher moisture rice, the 20 to 25 or 20 to 23 percent grain moisture range of application. Within three days, what we can see is as much or more than 3% grain moisture drop uh, after that, and not as much at lower moistures, but a lot are looking at those applications because it may not be dropping grain moisture as much, uh, but particularly with the use of stripper headers, the, the, the reduction in uh, the moisture of the foliage and everything, facilitating a better harvest that way. So. Uh, again, the goal is still to try to be done harvesting a, a field that was treated in five days or less uh, in that scenario. So with that one, uh, Dr. Butts, I have uh, one or two questions here lined up for you. Uh, and one of them is, that, do you see any problems with facet pre-emerge? I'm assuming that's referencing anything to, to have to do with rice injury or anything. Yeah, so there's some potential for injury out of facet pre, but in anything we've really done, even in the past few years where it's been cool and wet conditions and everything, you know, it, it's on the slighter end of injury. And it, the, the fact that we get so much better weed control out of it outweighs having the little bit of injury that we might see from it being applied pre. So I'm not saying you might not see some injury, but the weed control aspect of it trumps the little bit of injury that we might see because of it. One more. Are you seeing a significant difference in a three ounce rate of sharpen versus the two ounce rate applied as a pre? So that's a good question. I really haven't uh, done a two versus three comparison too closely to see it on hand. Um, I would say most of the time, especially when we're trying to apply that 
for earlier seeded rice, having a little bit of extra product in there to lengthen our residual time out is probably a benefit still. Um, but that probably is something we need to look at a little bit closer to try and make that comparison, especially from the economic front. But like I said, typically with early seeded rice, we'll get at least a little bit longer residual out of having the three ounces versus two. And so it can pay off at that point. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Wamishi, in row rice, do we have to worry about diseases in hybrids that we haven't had to deal with before? Well, one known disease is blast, but recently we are seeing also sheath fly to be important. So other than that, uh, we have not seen much. Uh, the, the, the smuts are there both in the hybrids and uh, I mean, uh, uh, conventional, whether it's flooded or not. Thank you, and I will note that a few top ends of row rice fields this year, uh, the Circospora or narrow brown leaf spot did appear to possibly be be worse, exaggerated, whether that's more fertility related or what, uh, a little uncertain. Um, yeah, and the weather condition as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, a couple of, of row rice questions I see here. Um, the, the, the small plot research uh, variety trial, I believe this is in reference to um, where the cold water effect was that present at the top end of all of those trials. Uh, again, where some of those yields were extremely low. On one of those field sites, yes, there was a cold water effect, but on the other one, it was uh, strictly surface irrigated but the, the, the beds essentially would not wick all the way through to the middle. So that, that was really the problem there. So again, different problems, but uh, each having a major problem on the top end of the field. Sorry, trying, trying to move around. Uh, Dr. Wamishi, I'll go ahead and throw one right back to you since I just actually made a comment in this regard. <laughs> well, I guess we kind of covered it. Why was there so much brown spot in CLL 15 uh, this year? Well, uh, brown spots, uh, we have been thinking uh, most of the effect is from stress. So we need to find out what stress factor is there. Uh, and uh, fungicide application is not recommended for brown spots. So we have to just find out the stress, the stress factor. Yeah, and I would blame a lot on the potassium deficiencies that we observed this year. And, and increasing that presence. And maybe CLL 15 is a little more susceptible to brown spot than we add the, the potash component. Uh, Dr. Bateman, a uh, question for you. Uh, are you concerned with the increase of rice stem borers? Yeah, you know, and especially for y'all guys up there in Northeast Arkansas, we walked several fields this year that, that have pretty extensive stem borer uh, activity going on out there. It is more than we, you know, commonly see around. Uh, it's still not a huge problem, but, you know, it, it does seem like for the guys that have seen it the past couple of years, it is increasing. You know, a few options you have there, and really the easiest option is going to help a Weevils too, is going with a Dermacore for Tenza. Uh, our counterparts in Louisiana and Texas, they see good control of stem borer, uh, particularly with Dermacore. You know, it lasts quite a bit longer than, uh, than for Tenza. We see control with it out to 90 to 100 days, whereas for Tenza is usually 60 to 70. So, you know, going one of those diamides will help with stem borers. But uh, the activity does seem to be picking up around the state, particularly in the Northeast over the past year. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Butts, do you think we are seeing an increase in grass escapes when mixing Sharpen with Propanil or even our burn down with Roundup? Um, I mean, I guess I haven't heard that or seen that um, too much. Sharpen really doesn't have great activity on grasses. And so typically when we start talking about reduced activity like that, it's with a burner and, and stuff, it's because we burn part of leaves off and then the rest of the herbicides can't get in there to work. With Sharpen not really burning grasses a whole lot, you know, I just wouldn't expect too much of a, like an antagonism there and the, the formulations, I don't think there's really antagonism there. So it's not something I've seen. Let's, let's just say that and not something I would typically expect um, out of Sharpen for grass control. Okay, thank you. 
Dr. Roberts, uh, comment, uh, I guess, come as much as a question. Uh, seemed to have more sulfur deficiency when we had flooded fields over the winter and then after the spring floods. Any comment on that? Uh, so this is a little bit complicated, but it's probably twofold. So sulfur in the soil is most often going to exist as sulfate, which is going to be like nitrate. So it's going to be prone to leaching. So anytime we have winter flooded conditions or prolonged flooded conditions, that sulfate can leach, you know, down uh, lower in the soil profile out of the root zone. Uh, so that's a potential reason. And then the second thing that a lot of people uh, don't necessarily understand and may take for granted is uh, sulfur, particularly sulfate, can be reduced under flooded conditions to hydrogen sulfide, which is actually what causes our hydrogen sulfide toxicity in many of our rice fields. So if we have winter flooded or prolonged flooded conditions when we're not growing rice, uh, those are two potential loss mechanisms for that sulfur is leaching below the root zone and then the reduction of that sulfate to hydrogen sulfide, which is then a gas, which uh, is a loss from, from the soil. And so there's, those are the two potential reasons why sulfur uh, deficiencies would be greater um, in areas that stay flooded longer outside of our rice production window. Okay, on this next one, Dr. Roberts, I'm, I'm going to jump in on it, but stick with me if you want to chime in with some additional comments. Uh, is row rice the best way to eliminate a salt problem? No. <laughs> um, what we have observed over the years, uh, past several, is on situations where there is a history of a salt problem, you know, particularly from, uh, from the irrigation water that the, the best thing we can do to, to get rice away from a salt problem is to get it to flood and get the flood on the field. We have observed even in fields that didn't have a history of a salt problem, in theory shouldn't have hardly had any, uh, when we started stacking water up in the furrows, the tops of the beds, that's where the salt began to wick out and die and kill and look like we had applied a, a burner herbicide. But once the water, standing water was removed from the furrows, they, the, what wasn't completely dead came back to life and moved on. So generally speaking, I would recommend avoiding fur irrigated rice where I believed I had a salt problem or the potential for one. Trent, would you like to add anything? I would completely agree. And I think even in moderate uh, soil salinity issues or, or salty irrigation water issues, bed configuration is going to play a, another major role in whether or not that problem becomes much worse or is manageable. And so if, if you're in an area where you have a marginal water quality or, or are concerned and you want to try row rice, I would flat plant it and pull uh, water furrows rather than pulling beds, just because that bed configuration aids and dictates where that salt concentrates. And so th those are some things to consider in addition to what uh, Dr. Hardke mentioned. Very good, thank you. Um, here's, here's a general one thrown out. Does anyone want to talk about DPS? So that being delayed phytotoxicity syndrome and uh, that, that is actually one that, that uh, is a multifaceted question uh, probably easily myself, Dr. Butts and Dr. Wamishi all have uh, some comments toward. Um, again, mainly from what we you know what we're dealing with with delayed phytotoxicity syndrome or some delayed phytotoxic shock. Uh, again, is the the inability of our rice plants to deal with uh, normally rice safe herbicides and essentially what's happening there is again normally rice safe herbicides. Um, under an anaerobic condition are, are ending up, or they're being dechlorinated. They're anaerobic fungi that actually take the chlorine off of it. And, and for whatever reason, that, that portion of it is what keeps it rice safe. And then when it's taken up by the rice, it's sick. Uh, so we usually recommend taking the flood off in that situation. Uh, Yeshi, Tommy, would you like to comment, dive in a little bit more on that one? We saw a lot of it in, in this past year. Yeah, let me go. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, good in identifying the, the symptoms. Uh, and when you go to the field, what you see is they are shorter in size than the ones which are not affected. 
And the other thing is uh, the tillers break off very easily. And also there are some uh, symptoms on the joints as well. So uh, maybe, you know, there might be, there might be some, some tillers also growing from the, the tillers. So removing the water for uh, like uh, drain and dry is one solution for it. I would say that's the only solution. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I was just going to add to, you know, in, in most of the fields that I've looked at, it's typically been a combination of like the perfect storm where it was facet, bolero, propanil, all the heavy hitters were all thrown at the field. And then it was moist, you know, the flood went on right away after, you know, like a pre-flood application of all of that or something. And it just overloaded it all at once. So it's, if we can space some of those herbicides out or try not to overload those real heavy hitters that are, that are bad for DPS, that's can help us out a little bit too, to not see such severe DPS symptomology. Yes. Bolero has been known to be the worst of the culprits for that. Propanil, as you mentioned, is going to be in there. Uh, facet isn't typically included. And again, there are a number of others, but pre, you know, further down the list in, in severity. But yeah, where we're stacking those, especially where we're stacking them up immediately prior to applying flood, uh, really seems to exaggerate where there's a little more time or those, those herbicides are in different applications spread out. Uh, generally a lot weaker response, but uh, the overlap areas of the fields are usually the turn into the sunken holes uh, where you get, get a 2x rate out there and it becomes very obvious. Um, Dr. Butts, while you're still at least up large on my screen, is Bassagran good on flat sedge, on rice flat sedge? Yes, this is easy answer. I like it. Uh, yeah, Bassagran for rice flat sedge right now across Arkansas because we have so much ALS resistance. Uh, Bassagran, uh, Propanil, and Loyant are our best three options. And Bassagran, I normally put towards the top of those three. So, okay, and, and one more fairly quick uh, with some of your 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 rate discussion. Uh, sorry, like GPA work discussion. What about labels that say ten GPA in your research? Uh, you're supposed to ignore that part of it. Uh, so, uh, so 10 GPA out of a plane is very, very, very difficult. Let's just say that it, it, it requires a special setup. It's, you have to narrow down. It's, uh, you know, I don't like saying possible, but it really honestly is. It's very, very difficult setup to get 10 GP out of a plane. Uh, so with any of my research there, I was trying to keep it, you know, as realistic as possible doing three to seven, because those are very common uh, spray volumes that were used, especially out of a survey I did that, that those were common responses of volumes getting used. Um, and so when it comes back to the label, all I can say is, uh, you know, have the aerial applicators do the best they can to reach that label requirement. I can't say any more than that. Yep. Agreed. Uh, Yeshi, one more for you. What varieties have resistance to narrow brown leaf spot? I have to look at the lists, <laughs> so I don't remember uh, remember it outright in my in my mind now. Well, I I, yeah. I, I don't either. The uh, yeah. big take home there is not many. Yeah, the, the the reaction table, which we post usually, and also in in rice information sheet, you can find it over there. Very good. Um, a couple of questions about the, the furrow irrigated rice nitrogen trials. So in those where we were discussing, where Justin was discussing the, the nitrogen rates applied and everything, none of those included an additional nitrogen application at the late boot stage that we traditionally recommend on hybrid rice. However, having said that with some other limited, in addition to the work that we've continued looking at that late boot nitrogen application in flooded rice, we have begun some preliminary work looking at the same thing in the fur irrigated system following some of those optimum recommended treatments we described. And we're seeing the similar benefits of, of an uptick in some head rice, a few bushels of yield 
and, and some increased standability. So that trend is still there. Um, that was just another, uh, I guess you'd say was another wrinkle we chose to not have in there looking at our early season nitrogen management uh, for Justin's trials in that situation. Uh, one moment. I think we're getting down to the very end. The last few of these are some fur irrigated things. Sorry, they may uh, go kind of toward me. Uh, if anybody has any remaining questions, go ahead and submit those now because I'm going to try to knock out uh, a few of these pretty rapidly. Does the DG263L have a fit in row rice? That is unknown for me as I haven't tested it in that format based on its yield potential and, and general disease package and what it's looked like from growth habit. Uh, it looks like it could have a place to play there, but again, not putting it in that system yet uh, myself through my research, uh, I, I need to see it stand up to, to that stress before I'm going to recommend that. Also, uh, what about CLL 16 on fur irrigated rice compared to CLL 15? Those two have looked pretty similar in our limited testing. Uh, to me, CLL 16 is likely to, to out yield CLL 15 in most environments, but I, I'm not convinced just off the 2020 data that we have comparing those two that, that one is necessarily uh, a, a great fit over the other. Again, uh, shallower slope, higher managed field. Uh, I think they're both potentially going to do a lot better uh, in 16, I think is going to be the winner, but I'm, I'm prepared to see it this year on, uh, on a few more production acres and see where we go on that. But uh, it, it certainly didn't jump out in a little bit of testing that we did already. Okay, this goes back to the irrigation water management portion of Justin's talk and I apologize, uh, he regretted he could not, could not be here today, so I have to tackle it. Did we water the entire field as in all blocks at the same time or did we have several sets? So keeping in mind those irrigation sets, those were very large blocks in field, so 20 plus, uh, furrows in each field and depending on which field it was in 800 to 1200 feet in length and and all of the reps of the, those large block reps were all irrigated at the same time uh, for whatever their irrigation trigger was so um, again we had a had a very good representation there um, I think that about wraps up most of our questions uh, for today uh, one remaining one is on the, the breakdown of CEU hours, and I believe that's going to be shown again at the very end, uh, as soon as we conclude, uh, just to give everyone a heads up on that. And, um, well, I guess I have one last one I'll throw at you, Tommy, that just popped up. It's a good one. Uh, how do you get rid of Johnson grass in row rice? Kevin, quit answering or quit, quit asking these questions. Uh, so Johnson grass in, uh, in row rice, uh, our best, uh, you know, and again, it's kind of, we don't have a lot of data on it just cause it's now it's a new weird weed, but the best options are going to be a clincher or regiment probably. Um, I, on the shatter cane side of things, which is like a cousin to Johnson grass clincher has worked great for, um, uh, managing that, but uh, those those would be my two uh, my two best uh, options for managing it is either uh, clincher or regiment, one of those two. Okay. Very good. Um, somebody said I haven't read about the production costs of furrow versus flooded rice. Any differences or about the same? What a great question. Um, you start telling me about where you are and, and what your equipment availability is, and, and it largely seems to go from there. Uh, when we've tried to generalize a budget, such as we did in the Fur Gated Rice Handbook, if you look back there, they come out very, very close in that scenario. Uh, again, kind of difficult to put a, a complete handle on because, you, again, you may be able to get across acres that much faster, technically need less equipment. But in the line item budget of trips across the field, things like that, it looks like it largely comes out pretty close. And many are making similar yields to what their three-year average is. Some are coming in about 10 bushels below, but saving trips and, and coming out pretty, pretty even for them. So, 
uh, that's that that one's definitely a moving target for us uh, when it comes to the fur irrigated versus flooded. Uh, big savings for many is when they can use the previous year's soybean beds and, and remove tillage from the system entirely. Some will likely get to do that because of some of the dry harvest window we had this past year in the previous two years, that was not an option at all. Um, and so I, I think that's gonna about wrap it up. We made it to 345. Um, so once more, I wanna recognize the importance of the Rice Checkoff Program. Again, that's part of what's even helping us answer questions here today, uh, work that we've done for that. If you asked a question we weren't able to get to, please visit uaex.edu to learn more. Uh, and thanks for joining us for the virtual rice production meeting.